The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. This is Scorpio Sky, and you are listening to the Keeping It Strong Style Podcast, and it is the best. Yo, this is Rich Ladder from One Nation Radio. This is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. We present to you the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Let's go. It's the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Covering New Japan, they ready to hold it down. Jeremy Donovan and the young boy Josh. Come and hit a job out in Barrio the Frogs. From the Tokyo Dome over to the G1. Social Suplex is the network where we can get it done. I'm a chill and let them have it because this is just an intro keeping the strong style six stars from the get-go boy yeah from tampa bay to the tokyo dome this is keeping it strong style with your host jeremy donovan and the young boy joshua smith and thank you for listening Welcome to Keeping It Strong Style, the ace of podcasts on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Jeremy Dominic here with the young boy Josh Smith and Jamie Spector. On today's show, we'll be discussing all the post-Russell Kingdom news, answering your questions, and covering all the latest news in the world of New Japan Pro Wrestling. You can support our show by subscribing to the Social Suplex Podcast Network or to Keeping It Strong Style on the podcast app of your choice and leaving a rating interview. You can also get all the podcasts and columns over at socialsuplex.com. Make sure you check out our Pro Wrestling Tea store, prowrestlingtees.com slash social suplex. That's where you can get your official Keeping It Strong Style t-shirt. Thank you for playing audio during my entrance. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> uh, and I can't stop it. <laughs> what uh, the f- uh, so if you enjoy this podcast Please consider making a donation By visiting socialsuplex.com Slash donate and clicking on the donate button Under the Keeping It Strong Style Logo So like I mentioned in the intro Not only am I joined by the young boy we're Joined by our New Japan correspondent Jamie Spector Hey, glad to be here. How yeah. you doing? Good, man. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Guys, I, I really apologize. Super unprofessional of me. <laughs> I think that's like one of the few and only times that that has ever happened in the history of this show. Man. My bad. You come in the studio, man. You put everything on silent, pal. That's what I was trying to do. I was like, oh, I got to make sure everything's on silent. I, wanna, I want the show to go really well. Jamie's here. It's a big day. Big moment, and then Snapchat was like, server, server. <laughs> and like I tried to discard it, and it was on repeat. Uh, yes, yeah. usually only happens in the bathroom, never on a podcast. <laughs> 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 trying to get some downtime at work. I, I, I'm not, I'm not too good with the technology. There's a reason why Jeremy runs everything technology related, including like all the social media, everything like that. Like, <laughs> like anytime Jeremy's like been out and he's like, can you post something? I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> Tweet? What is a tweet? <laughs> I like just I, I know how to respond to like messages in like Reddit and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, we have uh, Jamie on the show this week. He was over in Japan during Russell Kingdom weekend. Allegedly, was all <laughs> it's all no. sham. It's a lie. <laughs> it's a work. <laughs> None of it's true. I listen to a lot of conspiracy theorists <laughs> theory like uh, podcasts like all day, and I've been like just wondering like how do we really know he was really there. Uh, we got Jesse Ventura in the next room, right? Let's talk some conspiracy. What, what even is Japan? Time is a construct. Time is a flat circle. It's, you know, I, it's a fever dream. That's what it is. Yeah. I'm just getting over being very, very sick. Oh, me too. I got the Meltzer sickness in Japan. <laughs> yeah, dude. Meltzer was like dying on the air. Yeah, it was, it was rough. Dude, yeah. I, I was listening to one of his podcasts today, and he was like, <laughs> and I was like, yo, Y'all have so many subscribers, like, you can't edit this out. Right, like. you can't, like, <laughs> put a mark in there, like, as you cough, like, edit out. Like, come on, man. <laughs> Jim Valley was like, Dave, do you need to, like, put hit the mute button? Dave's like, <laughs> <laughs> Jim, Jim Valley was, I he was in worse shape than he Dave, was, man. Yeah. He was, yeah. I went to, so, I'm just going to jump ahead right yeah, now, go, you go, don't mind. go for it, man. So, yeah, I was, uh, I, I did the, the little Meltzer panel thing in Japan just because uh, I never really... I've seen Dave at shows, like, during Mania Weekend and stuff, Mm -hmm. um, but I've never, like, been to one of his panels, and dude is just, like, he fascinates me, (laughs) so I was like... We get it. You're a mark. Yeah, for sure. Oh, (laughs) definitely. (laughs) Definitely. I'm I'm doing this show, (laughs) so... (laughs) Um, But, yeah, I was just like, all right, I I gotta... I just have to go to one of these panels and see how he, you know, is... 
how he is in front of people, <laughs> like just be around that. And yeah, he was dying. Jim Valley was dying. Uh, Fumi was translating to dying men <laughs> in real time. Uh, and it was real awkward, but um, I love the guy. He's great. Um, and uh, Japan is great. Everyone should go if you have the opportunity. <laughs> Tokyo Dome is amazing. So, man, when, so the last time you were on the show was after your last trip to Japan. What, was that for Dominion? Uh, no, it was the G1 finals. That's right, 20, yeah. That's right. yeah. 2018 G1, not, so, not 2019. So it's been over a year since we had you on last. Right. Man, well, we're glad to have you. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, you know, take us through it, man. Yeah, so um, uh, I guess it's not uh, the most interesting, but just, you know, planned it out. Um, I, I decided to go a little bit before New Year's, just uh, I was able to make it work. So I was there on the ground about... 11 days like two weeks all together um so i ended up going to five shows uh, i did the ddt new year show with uh, big japan the, the new year shuffle show i did all japan um uh big japan and then uh and then stardom and then the rest were all just you know new japan night one night two new mm. year's dash you weren't you, you weren't able to fit in that noah <laughs> <Corbin> <laughs> Hall show. i couldn't make it happen it was just uh logistically it was i that that show was sold out yeah you couldn't get tickets i was yeah. able to get a ticket even for stardom which is like a tiny tiny arena uh you know little little gym and yeah they they Filled out Cork and Hall. It was impossible. You should have gone seen uh, Fedor and Rampage. <laughs> was it, oh, did they do the Rising show? Uh, well, they did. There was the Rising show a couple days later, but they partnered. They did two shows. So there was a uh, Bellator show. Okay. Um, from Sai Saitama Super Super Arena. Okay. Like two days before that, and both of them were co-promoted by Ryzen and Bellator. And yeah, it was it was sad. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I part of me kind of wants to do rising in japan just because uh i'm not like the biggest mma fan or anything but like the the pride entrances are like those are the best ring entrances wrestling or, or mma in my opinion like they're insane better they're, than the fiend better than the fiend <laughs> he doesn't have lenny hart like if lenny hart was out there like a lot of fiend like <laughs> do, you know with that full butt yeah yeah just like she doesn't even need a microphone, just screaming into a, an abyss. Like I would be, I'd be a hundred percent way on more on board with uh, with WWE right now. But uh, I guess they can't get Lenny Hart. They can't do it. Vince just doesn't have the money for it. But um, that's not the only Japanese thing that they couldn't buy. <laughs> um, so yeah, man. So you were in the dome, man. What was like the atmosphere there inside the dome? Just the general uh, excitement of the people, kind of coming to the shows. So they put all the gaijin in like one box. Like we all had like one side of the arena. So uh, it was a little bit disappointing because you want the authentic, we want to be there with the locals, right? But like, I can't really complain too much. Um, just excitement was, you know, you had all your LIJ fans just <laughs> chomping at the bit. I, it wouldn't have been pretty if uh, if Jay White won in that first night. It would, it would have been... Uh, it would have been pretty bad, and uh, but yeah, it's just like everyone was super excited to be there. I met so many like cool people from around the world, like people from New Zealand, the UK, um, Pennsylvania, <laughs> <laughs> all, all the exotic spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was um, it was cool. It was just like you could definitely. It was like it was a lot like Mania Weekend, where you can um, like obviously when you're outside, you know, the arena, you have everyone out there but like even like bef between shows just like walking around tokyo depending on where you're at um you could definitely tell like oh okay this person this person's gonna here's that person's here for night so they're lij fans out here <laughs> like you could just and you know in my hostel like i talked to like two or three people like that were going to the event like nice one, uh, one person was going to like all the events like i saw him editing his pictures from DDT, so I'm like, oh, we're hanging out for like the rest of the week. So <laughs> nice. It was uh, it was pretty dope. What was um? So you you sat with all the Gaijin um, fans you mentioned. Yeah. Was the were they pretty respectful and sort of like Japanese audience, or did you did you catch any like indiness sort of thing going on? Um, whatever. Yeah, whatever <laughs> indiness, quote unquote. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that might have been kind of. Uh, trying to get out, like people shut it down pretty quick. Your Minreg Hall, if you would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, that's the world famous. <laughs> it's a deep cut for uh, <laughs> any fans of the show. But uh, no, I, I thought you know I was I was pretty like kind of like I get I I am pretty I get pretty perturbed at shows like when uh, people try to ruin it. Um, I had a foam finger incident at the one AEW <laughs> show. Oh, yeah, five was to the fall. N- not <laughs> not happy about it, but like I don't know. Everyone was pretty cool. It was like. You might get one or two people making comments here and there. I noticed when uh, when the Stardom Dark match was happening, you had a lot of people just had no idea what it was, and people were like uh, you know, talking through the match and stuff. It wasn't too dissimilar from like you know your two hundred five live pre show match in WrestleMania or whatever. But other than that, it was like pretty respectful. Um, you didn't really have a lot of American style chanting. Okay. Um, I didn't. I didn't. It was totally fine. Um, I guess not too dissimilar from the the Dallas G one uh, with you guys. No, it, um, it, they were okay. Um, I mean, it was it was the most authentic uh, like crowd experience for an American New Japan show I've ever been to. But there was still a lot of elements of like your regular like yeah. North American fan base. Right. I mean even during the press conference when they let the, the crowd in for that first part yeah. when the guys were on stage like it was definitely like people doing like their American style indie chants. Oh my god. <laughs> Which yeah. I wasn't too opposed to with the fact that they came to America to do a show and it sure. some, some, some of that stuff is to be expected S- similar to like I guess if you go to England and they're doing the uh, you know their chants and they're singing and everything like that's kind of what the reaction you want to get there. But I, I, my concern was like you know you hear stories of uh, uh, you know Western and foreign fans kind of acting acting a fool, you know when they go to some of these uh, you know pro shows. Yeah, I mean it was a pretty big section, so I can't really speak for everybody. But at least where I was sitting, it was totally fine, um, very respectful. I would say um, you had when Jericho came out, you had a little bit of the like oh like you know. It, it, a lot more Jericho stands <laughs> that yeah, would have liked for we're, a ton we're of talking Le match. Champion. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I can't. A little bit of the bubble. Yeah. I can't get mad at that though. That's, that's yeah. We were talking off air. You said there was like a lot of people that were like cheering Jericho for on. For sure. Right? For sure. D- now, two questions. Um, one, where you guys were seated, did you have pretty good sight lines? Did anything obstruct the view? I heard some stories about people that had issues in that area. And um, number two, do you feel like you were able to kind of gauge audience reaction, even though you weren't? Surrounded by like say the domestic fan base. Um, yeah, I guess to answer the first question uh, for me personally I went with the um, The 1f stand so if you ever buy tickets to whether you're going to Budokan Hall or Tokyo Dome or a bigger arena at least for wrestling at least in my experiences the way the tickets work is you have like the the fan club seats which are called Royal Seats, I believe. I might be wrong on that. I, th- I don't know if there's two different sections, but those are like the ringside. You get a special chair. Those are like impossible to get unless you have like connections that live in Japan that can get you access to those. So you might just want to write those off. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we, we have fanboys that are like, actually, it's called this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, someone will correct you on that, I'm sure. So there no, you go. No, you're fine. Um, but you, so you have those. Then you have the arena seats, which are floor seats, more or less. And then you have your... 1F stand, your 2F stand, and then you have your, uh, like, outfield or, you know, whatever standing room section seats that you have. Um, from going to the Budokan show at, in G1, um, I had tried the stand seats and I had tried the arena seats. And in my experience, it's cool to be on the floor. You're, you're <laughs> definitely closer. You get some really good pictures if you're, like, within, um, like, the ramp or whatever. But I was not a big fan to watch the matches that way because... Unless you're, like, right up there, like, two, three, four sections, like, next to the ring, Mm -hmm. you're not seeing anything that's happening on the mat. So, like, forget about watching any Zack Sabre match, (laughs) um, seeing what's happening. Um, I think that's pretty much always our take is it's better to be elevated, especially in a big arena. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, like, with with that in mind, like, when I bought my seat, I just went with the, you know, the nearest... Um, I guess like stand, stand the the stands, you know, out uh, not outfield, but like I was kind of like right around home home plate, like because it's a baseball field, uh, and I was pretty far away, but I had really good view of like my line of sight was like perfect. I was like right there, center field, 
<laughs> I'm going all over the map today <laughs> for baseball, but I was right there, like center, like center eye line, right uh, with like the, the the ring being kind of in center field where I was like right near home plate, and uh, yeah, pretty far away, but. I felt like I could see everything that was happening, even though if I would probably want to watch the screen for a lot of stuff that was happening to get those great like New Japan camera angles. You don't, you know, make sure you don't miss anything. Um, so I don't know. My it, this is a personal preference, but if you have a chance to go to one of these events, I would opt for the, the elevated stand, just like you said, um, unless you really want to just be in that like, closer to the ring so you can, like, feel it or whatever. But I would rather watch, be able to see what's happening in the ring. Um, and then uh, I guess the, the second part of that question is, uh, you know, was I able to gauge crowd reaction? Abs- yeah, was it, absolutely. Was, it, was it more localized because you were just with a certain segment of the fan base? Or do you feel like... Um, the, the audience as a whole, you could kind of gauge that sort of thing. It wasn't so localized. Definitely for, it was interesting because there were parts where the crowd would like get into certain spots that the Americans didn't really pick up on. Not Americans, but like Westerners didn't really pick up on immediately. Like um, I definitely felt that in like the Sonata, the Sonata match. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've always noticed that um, being a fan of Puro, especially with their long history of like shoot fighting and shoot wrestling background, that like the Japanese audience will be very key to pick up on something as nuanced as like a type of arm bar and pop for it, whereas like a Western audience might just see it as a rest hold and, and not be as educated on it, sort of thing. Right. It's it's hard for me to say like, oh, you guys aren't educated enough to get the nuance of an arm bar. <laughs> like, I don't know if I'd go that far, but uh, it was it was just interesting to see like, because there were parts you know where everyone like was kind of like popping like in my in our section that I didn't really feel like the whole crowd. And then obviously you have like in that Abushi match in the Naito finale match, there was just like you know moments in those matches that everyone was just like going wild for it was it was pretty incredible mm. um i was a little surprised that the you know outside of the entrances like the liger match matches didn't really get the big reaction that i was maybe hoping for but i guess that was more of a new year's dash thing i think um, people were sad yeah yeah I, yeah <laughs> every time he lost like he somber on, on the stream it sounded like the air just went out the building <laughs> but when he made his entrance they the, the pop was pretty incredible oh yeah yeah i think the first night, for some reason, I felt like the pop was bigger. When he, or maybe it was just us in the There room. was more people in the building. Right, there's 10,000 more people, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. I guess that's granted. <laughs> <laughs> it was also, I think people were just excited. I mean, outside of the, you know, the dark match and, like, some of the, like, that was, like, the kickoff yeah. match, too. And people were excited. It's the Tokyo Dome. So, yeah, you just, more people in the building. It's freaking Liger. Yeah. Um, yeah, then that match was that match was cool. It was a big nostalgia trip for everybody. Speaking of the size of the audience, um, is this the largest uh, wrestling audience you've ever been a part of? Uh, I don't know. WrestleMania, I was at thirty one. Okay, so that was definitely bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was in what Levi Stadium. Yeah, right? yeah. So, how did these two kind of contrast? You know, from one another. I mean, obviously it, that was an outdoor arena. Yeah, um, I mean, it's definitely. I just felt like there was a lot more engagement. Um, it's also the, the the nuances of a you know you, you have a quiet crowd at WrestleMania. <laughs> it's it's a different <laughs> vibe than a quiet crowd. Uh, you know, at a at a Wrestle Kingdom where uh, people are quiet because they're watching the matches, whereas like people are quiet at a Mania match. <laughs> they're they're getting up to go to the bathroom. They're buying Skittles. Like I don't know what they're doing, right? But, but um, I did want to ask you about that. So on the um, <clears throat> on the second night, there were a lot of times where it felt like viewing, and this was something that uh, that I felt more strongly about. I think Jeremy, you didn't like. I think your take was that you felt like people were engaged in their viewing, right? Yeah, and I felt like it can't kind of came off as though there was less energy in the building, like people were tired, tireder, and were popping less than they were the, the night before. Did you feel that way about the second night, or do you think it was that people were engaged and just viewing? Um, well, I think the matches generally, like, you had, like, two incredible match- matches that first night, and then, you know, like, I-, I felt like people were not getting up for the losers match, like the, the Bushi and-, right. and Jay White match. Also, there was a lot of interference. It's, like, stuff to, like, 
I think there was stuff designed to get a reaction that people were just kind of like, all right, you know, yeah, cause <laughs> whatever. It, it seemed to me like the energy level really picked up during the semi and the main, obviously. Like, right. Like, those two, the reaction to those two matches rivaled almost anything the first night. Yes. But everything preceding that on that second night seemed a little down. And I wasn't sure if it was just people were, like, saving their energy for the end or if they just weren't into it or maybe they were tired or maybe they were just being respectful. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of all of those. Like, yeah. like, <laughs> like, I think there was stuff, there was definitely, like, stuff on the first night that you were going to get bigger pops for. Like, I mean, the the uh, Abushi Okada match was just, like, yes. incredible. Yeah. Um, you know, the the entire Osprey Hiromu match on that first night, you could be popping like that entire match. It was just like nonstop. And um it was tough to follow that one. <laughs> uh, so speaking of crowd reactions, and especially the second night, what was your feel during the Kenta angle where Kenta yeah. attacked Naito? Like how do you think the crowd reacted? How was like the guys in section reacting? And then what was the kind of feedback you were kind of seeing or hearing from um, local fans? Oh, people hated it. You know, people were disgusted. It was like... Was it good heat or bad heat? <sighs> was it like indifference or was it anger? Or? I hated it. Yeah. I, I, I didn't need it. <laughs> I, I know, like, I'm not, like, mad at it. I'm not like, oh, get, like, fuck ghetto or anything. Like, I don't really, you know, I'm not going to get too down on the booking. It probably makes sense from a business move. But being there, I'm just like, eh, I don't want to see this. Like, do this at Dash or whatever to the next day. But, like... Yeah, oh, people do it at dash. Go yeah, figure. <laughs> yeah, people people didn't like it. I I I I'm not really great at gauging is this good heat, is this bad heat too much. Um, but people really hated that. Uh, a lot of booze. Um, no one was, but like I feel like it was like you could only be so mad. You got everything you wanted. Right, like that you, weekend. You, you got the moment of Naito pinning Okada. Right. Actually, you know, he had a little bit of a celebration before Naito came in. So, like, you, you got that big moment, and then they were kind of setting the angle up for um, right new beginning in Osaka. So there was so I, people were definitely like they just wanted that like Lij celebration with the confetti, like the end of his, you know the G one twenty seventeen, um, but. At the end of the day, people were just like pumped that that Naito took you know both belts. So it's like no one no one really stayed that mad in the moment. It was like boo this <laughs> man, you know. But like no one was really that upset with it. It wasn't like some WWE shit. <laughs> it wasn't the Fiend and Seth Rollins Hell in a Cell. Yeah, um, Kent is not going to come out the next day and get you know, 15 minutes of booze, nonstop booze, like, as much as people say they hate him, like... Yeah, that was something we were wondering about because I think the audience at home watching that angle play out might have felt one particular way, and then I've heard some um, other shows and people that were there kind of discuss their opinion of what, what it was like to experience it live, but, you know, I wasn't sure if people were responding in a positive way, not that no one's positive about it, but, like, that it's, like... Oh my God! I want to see Naito get his comeuppance. I want to see him, you know, get the. I want to see him beat the crap out of Kenta. Yeah, right. or, or people are just like, man, they did this to my dog again. Like <laughs> after all this time, and you know, it's hard. To, it's hard to really get, uh, you know, a true read on that. So I would. That's why we're interested to kind of see what your feeling on it was. Yeah, um, I, I get that. I, I it's. I, I'm not great at this, but like the 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 booze in the in the building were definitely like. Palpable, like people were like in that moment, like, like there was hatred. Oh yeah, people hated him, and it was like it was also just like kind of weird because like I feel like a lot of times New Japan, everything like New Japan all like makes sense, and in that moment, I'm like Kenza just lost, right? Right. He's yeah. like now he's gonna challenge for both belts. Like I, if anything, I would have expected it to be like a Sonata turn or an Evil turn or something, you know, something. But like. I, it's that one. It's just that whole thing where it's like they didn't leave any breadcrumbs, so you could like foreshadow it. It was just like, oh, Goto. I guess one is never belt. Awesome. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> moving on to bigger, and better things. Well, it's funny because you know a lot of wrestling fans of different uh, promotions and eras and storylines. You know, one segment might paint the story one way, and then someone else can kind of be an apologist for it. You know, and one way someone could apologize for that is they could say, oh, well. It makes perfect sense because Kenta's not deserving to 
because he lost. So it gets even better heat because he's not really supposed to be there. And to be honest, I can I can buy that because in my head I'm just like this makes no sense. Right, <laughs> and it's the whole thing of like <laughs> Naito is not not like accepting this like challenge from this valiant like number one contender like. He wants to fight this dude. He wants to get revenge for ruining this moment that he's been waiting so long for. Right. So he's going to give him the match because he wants to get revenge, not like, oh, this will be a great like challenger for me. But, right. But when I think of it that way, I I don't want to sound like a Fed Defense Squad person who's like making apologies for the bad booking, you know. And to me, I, I'm like you. I didn't love this but you know i i get it but it wasn't like my cup of tea i would have preferred that they did the next night sort of yeah. thing but i did notice at new year's dash there was like a lot of the, the fans are chanting go home kenta and there seemed to be a lot of heat towards kenta did you notice that when you were in the building there for new year's dash yeah um there was definitely heat uh but again i didn't feel like it was the like he got booed for sure and people hated him but it wasn't super strong it wasn't like uh, WWE shows or American shows where people are just like, I'm going to just keep booing and not stop. Like, right. when, like when Dan Math Matha comes out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It it's, like, it's almost like the crowd kind of knew their part kind of like. Yeah, exactly. Like we're supposed to boo this guy when he comes out, but then like once he's wrestling and talking, like we're going to kind of like just watch. <laughs> yeah, and, and this could also just be a cultural difference, but like I'm seeing Kenta and I'm like, these people are being way too kind to this guy. <laughs> like did you guys not see what happened last night? But like because I want, I'm like, this guy needs to get booed out of the building right now. And people definitely booed him, but then it was like, okay. He's out here now. <laughs> we can just kind of like I don't know. You can go back and watch it. Uh, I felt like I'm like, man, you, can, you really need to dig into this guy a little bit more. Yeah, from my perspective. So moving on from that angle, um, you know, tell us from your perspective, just any general thoughts that you had about the Dome Show, things that kind of stick out to you, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I think the 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 big moments play just really big. In, a, in an arena like that, when everyone's kind of in sync and everyone's, like, hanging on the one or two things. Because, you know, some of those big, epic, you know, Tokyo Dome matches, they're they're dense. Like, you can you can pick out all these, like, little spots and little things that are happening. And, and when you have, like, you know, 40,000 people or whatever all kind of in on that exact moment as it's happening, it's pretty incredible. Like, it's... And it, it is, it's a little weird, too, because, like, you don't have the... You might not get, like, all the sound that you would get, like, you know, while you, like, like the ring isn't mic'd up as well as, like, maybe a WWE event. Um, so you're you're really just going off of the visuals and the, you're picking up on the energy of the crowd as well. So, like, that that... It's definitely not the best way to, like, watch all the nuances of the match unless you're, like, right there in the front. But, like... Being being around that energy is just pretty incredible, and uh, if you ever get the chance to do it, highly recommend it. Um, nice. So uh, before we kind of wrap this segment up, why don't you just kind of give listeners some like some great spots to kind of go in Japan, just like New Japan stuff, like the shop and other stuff that you went to, and just like food and other stuff like that. Too. Travel tips, tra- yeah. going to Japan, that sort of thing. Right. So there's a few few <laughs> tips. Um, I prefer to stay in an area that's like a little bit quieter in Japan. So like one thing to know about um, Tokyo and most most big cities in Japan is that the, the metro is like kind of everything. Like that's the way you get around. It's it's pretty incredible. Um, but the trains shut down at midnight. So like mm. if you are far away from where you need to get back to, um, like if you're staying somewhere in the city and you need to get back there, just like you need to always kind of be aware, like especially if you like to go out after an event, have some, you know, high ball or some sake or whatever. Um, <laughs> strong just, zero. Some strong zero, yeah. Uh, you just need to, um, They it's not like they don't have cabs and Uber. They have all that. It's just very, very expensive. So you can either, and anyone who's been to Japan knows about this, but like, you know, you can either spend a ton of money to get back where you need to be, or you can just kind of stay out all night and, I got sick pretty early in on, so <laughs> I wasn't really out there doing a lot of heavy drinking um, um, during the, the nights of the Dome. But, like, uh, yeah, just th- – so it's really just on preference. If you prefer to kind of, like, be out and, like, go, you know, drink in or go partying or maybe go see some music or something and you're, like, going to wrestling during the day or, or after whatever, you should probably stay in, the in the in like, the 
busier, more happening areas like a Shinjuku, Shibuya, that or Rapungi or that kind of thing. Um, where I I prefer to kind of stay away from a lot of that. Like the I, I just don't like being around all that stuff where I'm staying. Um, so I, I don't prefer to do that, but I know a lot of people who do. So that's a big tip is just decide like where in the city you like like to stay and then mm. keep that in mind um, when you're when you're like doing stuff after the events because um, it's pretty important. Um, outside of that, like going like sightseeing and stuff, go to Cork and Hall if you get the if you get the chance. Um, if you're going to like another like next year's Tokyo Dome, you might not get to see New Japan at Korokin, but you'll definitely be able to get to see like an All Japan show, Big Japan show. There are Noah shows. There's just shows every night. Um, That's can, awesome. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what promotion you go see, but you should go to Cork and Hall. It's incredible. It's like. My one of my favorite parts about going to Japan is just going to Korokin. Um, it's an incredible building. The vibe in there is like perfect for wrestling. Um, if you go to something like an All Japan, even if you don't like follow it, and you get to see someone like a Kenta Mihara, and you get to uh, watch like a big like long build like main event, um, being in, a, in a, an arena like that or a building like that is is awesome. In, in some ways, it's better than the Tokyo Dome, in my opinion. Um, so do that if you get the chance. Outside of that... Um, food. Food, yeah. Um, you know, ramen, sushi, okonomiyaki. Mm. Get some of that okonomiyaki. It's dope. <laughs> um, if you don't know what that is, it's like a, uh, it's like a pancake with, like, pork and uh, cabbage and a bunch of other... Stu- ingredients it's like a big sloppy mess and then there's different styles the i prefer to the hiroshima style which has like noodles and stuff in it but um yeah, get you know, some of that good friend of the show and our other uh, japanese correspondent uh zach porter he's got an okonomiyaki uh um set at home and he keeps talking about making it we need to get, get on this man it's yeah dope. uh get some of that put some of the I japanese mayonnaise on there yeah uh <laughs> it's it's incredible um so yeah do that um, stores, uh, go to Totacon. Uh, New Japan store is fine, whatever. You can go there. It's not very big, you know, but really the, the store you need to go to is Totacon. Any any of these podcasts talking about Japan will, will tell you, like, it's incredible. Like, it's just like a museum. Every, for every era of pro wrestling, MMA, uh, sumo wrestling, it's like everything you could possibly care about is at this store. It's incredible. And um, we were in a group chat, and I was making a joke, and I was like, make sure you bring me, bring me back some fight posters. This man brought so much, like, just Japanese paraphernalia, like, uh, weekly pros, uh, st- just so so much stuff. And then yeah. uh, you brought me back uh, three posters, one from uh, Suzuki's... Pile one, driver store. From his store. Yeah. That, that poster is amazing. Yeah. Uh, that might be a, a giveaway for later in the year for one of our contests. But uh, you also got me a couple pancreases, like authentic fight posters. I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, dude. And those pictures you brought back were super cool. Oh, yeah, you have a ama- yeah, you brought back amazing we'll, pictures. We'll have to like, do you guys have like an Instagram or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll have to put those on there. Oh, we'll um, definitely po- post that stuff. There's just like, yeah, I spent a whole. I so I went back to Totacon like probably five or six times when I was there. It's very accessible by the train because like. I you know the, the 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 coolest thing they have there is the wrestling masks. They have like yeah, liger you, you, masks. You didn't bring any Sasuke. masks back this time. No, I didn't, I, I, didn't have, I didn't have the funds this time. But um, if you can get past all the crazy masks and, and ring costumes and stuff and t-shirts, they have just like boxes of just like old photos, uh, tickets, programs. Um, you didn't go press passes did from you? the nineties. It's insane. Did you go to the uh, the forbidden section of Totocon? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. With the, uh, with the Joshi women's attires that have been worn and used. <laughs> oh God, yeah, they have like they um, have that stuff. People like it. Yeah, yeah they, they have. Uh, yeah, it's like behind beads or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I didn't see a lot of that, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. The place is just dense. You could spend easily spend an afternoon, two afternoons there, and like not even see like. My favorite thing that you brought back is uh, your um, ticket from the Budokan. Yeah. Um, 6394. 6394. If that date isn't uh, etched in your memory, that is the most famous matchup between uh, Mizawa and uh, uh, Kawada. Yeah. And 
that's incredible to have a piece of history like that. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I got. I was able to get that the VHS tape of that as well. Um, if you like VHS tapes, they got mountains of that stuff, um, all in like amazing quality with like the box art and everything. It's it's. Yeah, go go there. Go to Totacon. Uh, go multiple times if possible, and bring like extra suitcases and stuff, <laughs> whatever you need. Um, Suzuki store, pile driver. Sometimes he's hanging out. Uh, I didn't catch him there. Um, probably. Did you go to any of the bars, any of the wrestler bars, or restaurants? Um, not this time. Not this time. I'm trying to think if I did. I don't think so. But so so you obviously have. Um, What's the main one? The uh, the steakhouse. Ribera. Uh, you got Ribera. It's got two locations. Go to Ribera. You should do it. It's like everyone should go if you're in Japan. But honestly, like, it didn't really do much for me when I was there. Like, other than, like, this, the food's okay. It's not that great. It's like flank steak. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, but you should definitely, it's definitely, like, one of those kind of, like, bucket list places. But um I know Yano's got a bar that's pretty close by. Yeah, you brought uh, you have one of the flyers or advertisements yeah. where his bar it's hilarious. Yeah, uh, <laughs> he, he has like a, he's like doing a lot of cross brand. There it is. With, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's selling, kind of, <laughs> he's selling ramen now. <laughs> it's, or, kind of no, it's curry. It's curry. That's what it is. Yeah, some curry. Um, yeah, there's some ramen in there too. Some tonkatsu. Um, that's awesome. But uh, Do yeah, you hear that wrestling, ladies and gentlemen. That is an official. Poster. For That's an official Toro Yano <laughs> advertisement. Yeah, let's get some of that Foley in here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, Yano's bar that he's usually hanging around uh, sometimes. I, di- I didn't go there on this trip. Um, Mr. Danger's got a bar, um, if you're familiar with uh, FMW. I know I know some of the, I forget which Joshi, there's a there's a famous Joshi bar where a lot of the like Joshi women's wrestlers work at. Um, and I love this stuff. We could talk about it all day. We got to move on. But before we do, I just want to ask you: You went to a lot of shows, saw a lot of things, a lot of great matches. Just bucket or like r- real quick, like rapid fire, top three moments of the trip that stand out to you. Um, man, uh, probably just like everyone that I got to meet up with. Um, I met a ton of cool people. Um, so that's always fun. It's just like. Meeting people, it's a lot like Mania Weekend. You meet up with them, like a lot of most of the people you meet, like haven't really been to Japan before, so you're like kind of bonding over being in this like strange place. So that's like not really a moment, just kind of like an experience thing that I love. I love that kind of stuff. So fan, um, fan bonds is number one. Fan bond for sure. Yeah, nice. Give us two more. Uh, Naito taking it. Okay. Lij taking it all the way. Destino. Um, Destino for sure. Um, and then number three. Probably like, probably Totacon. Just going back to Totacon like eight times. Yeah, that place rules. Awesome, sweet. Well, uh, now we're going to uh, move on and talk about what's next in New Japan. As far as you know, the the big New Japan branded shows. We have the New Beginning tour coming up. So uh, first, we have the New Beginning in USA shows. We yeah, have- forget this Japanese stuff. Let's talk about America. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, so uh, January 24th, first stop on the tour right here in Tampa, Florida. Our main event, we're going to have an, an elimination match with Hiroshi Tanahashi, Kota Ibushi, Juice Robinson, David Finley, and Rocky Romero against the Bullet Club team of Tama Tonga, Tangaloa, Yujiro Takahashi, Chase Owens, and Jado. We're going to have Yoshihashi versus Lance Archer, Jeff Cobb versus Alex Zane, TJP and Carl Fredericks versus Cole Cabana and Toriano. Toshi Kojima and Yuji Nagata versus Ren Narita and Alex Coughlin and Clark Connors versus Mysterioso. And then on January 26th in Nashville, we got Abushi, Juice, Finley, and Romero versus Tamatonga, Tangaloa, Chase Owens, and Jado. Uh, we got Tanahashi versus Yujiro Takahashi, Yuji Nagata versus Lance Archer, Kojima versus Jeff Cobb, Jeez. TJP and Clark Connors versus uh, Cabana and Yano, Yoshihashi versus Carl Fredericks, Ren Narita and Alex Coughlin versus Alex Zane and Mysterioso. Then we got uh, January 27th in Durham. We got Hiroshi Tanahashi, Ibushi, Juice, Finley, and Yoshihashi versus Tamatonga, Tangaloa, Yudro, and Chase Owens, and Jado. And, and it's not an elimination match, so suck it, Durham. <laughs> <laughs> Narita versus Archer, Cobb versus Fredericks, uh, the Rock and Roll Express versus Coca Ben and no, Toriyama. And Alex Zane. Oh, hold on. My, uh, sorry, my screen went down here. 
So yeah, Rock and Roll Express and Alex Zane versus Cabana Yano and Rocky Romero. Kojima and Nagata versus Clark Connors and Alex Coughlin and TJP versus Mysterioso. <laughs> then on January 30th in Miami, we got Tanahashi Ibushi versus God. Finn Juice and Rocky Romero versus Yujiro, Chase and Jado, Alex Zane versus Lance Archer, Jeff Cobb versus Ren Narita, Rock and Roll Express versus Cabana and Yano, uh, Kojima and Nagata versus Fredericks and Coglin, Yoshihashi and Mysterioso versus TJP and Clark Connors. And then the last leg of the tour will be in Hotlanta, Atlanta, February 1st. Their main event, they got the IWGP tag title match as Finn Juice defends against the former champions G.O.D., It'll be Kota Ibushi versus Chase Owens, Jeff Cobb versus Lance Archer, Tanahashi and the Rock and Roll Express versus TJP, Alex Zane, and Clark Connors, Cabana and Yano versus Yujiro and Jado, Yoshihashi and Rocky versus Coglin and Mysterioso, and then Kojima and Nagata versus Fredericks and Ren Narita. And we did get a question from front of the show, Dan Kaufman. He says, how do you guys feel about the New Japan of America cards? Do you think they, sh- they should have had more significant singles matches? Well, um, that's a great question, Dan. And, you know, I got to tell you, I understand the sentiment of some fans here in the States that were maybe somewhat disappointed by some of the matches that were listed, you know, especially with, um, you know, I think the ticket prices for that we've seen, um, you know, thrown, thrown around have been, for the most part, pretty fair. I think where it gets people a little bit out of whack is the first row and second row tickets where I think first row on most shows is like nearly $200. 200 bucks, yeah. And then it drops to like, what, 80 Yeah, third row is like 85 Yeah, so th- those are a little bit pricey, but overall, if you're getting, these are going to be smaller, uh, you know, arenas somewhere in the 800 to 2000 range. And the general admission tickets are about 30 to 35 dollars which really isn't too bad if you're considering the level of talent i mean you're getting to see abushi tanahashi and some other big names the rock and roll express <laughs> yeah on two of those shows archer god so i mean you you have really good talent here um these are very authentic lineups when it comes to the amount of japanese talent and you know, I don't think it's fair for people to kind of complain about like who's coming over the way that maybe it would have been during the uh, that U.S. tour last year where the visas didn't come through. Um, so, I mean, on that point, you are getting a chance to see a lot of great talent. But one thing that's really awesome is we're getting on every single show multiple singles matches. And if anybody is a you know, if you're a longtime uh, viewer of New Japan Pro Wrestling, you, you'll come to realize. It's very rare to even get a singles match. Um, most of the New Beginning uh, tour, the Road to New Beginning tour in Japan, they're exclusively all multi-man tag matches. You're getting nothing but, you know, eight-man, six-man, ten-man tags. Whereas here, you're getting a lot of singles action, which is something that's pretty coveted. And the fact that, yeah, there's some names on there you might not be as familiar with, like Alex Zane, uh, you know, Mysterioso, stuff like that, but... Yuji Nagata, Lance Archer, Jeff Cobb, Kojima. Um, you know, those are some big names. I think even, isn't Tanahashi, Kota Bushi and Chase Owens, is, that's that's a singles match. I think Tanahashi's got a singles match in here somewhere. Like, yeah, against uh, Yujiro in Nashville. Yeah. That's, those, top to bottom, these shows are probably actually better than the new than the road to new beginning tour shows that you're getting um you know that are happening around the same time in japan and if you compare these cards to what most uh you know smaller sh- like smaller cities in japan get throughout the year when they get their quote unquote road to shows which if we if we think about it that's pretty much what these are they're road to shows essentially these are superior than what you would generally get in japan i mean i'll Right, there, there are people there, that would die to have this. Right, there are people who live in like the little neighborhoods that they don't get to see a singles match or ever. Any, yeah, they have to go to like a big pay per view style show. So, let me ask you this question because I, I I generally agree with that, but it, at the end of the day, it's you know still a road to show. They didn't really announce anything at Wrestle Kingdom for America, and it's like after all that hype of like oh New Japan USA. Like where's the you know where's the next like strong style evolved where you actually do get that big singles yeah. match like yeah 
Yeah, I think what, what's what's this building towards is kind of like right. I think the problem is they just didn't have a lot of details finalized to announce because sure. what, what we've been hearing is that in August, since the G one is going to be in um, October in the fall, that they're going to have a, you know a big spot in the summer. They're going to do something big internationally in the summer. Uh, there's been rumors of Madison Square Garden. Not <laughs> sure if that's um, still happening, but I think August there's going to be something big going on. Here's the thing. If if they had announced that they were going to do some sort of, like, let's say they're going to do the USF Sundome in Tampa, you know, uh, and do a 5,000 seat or plus, you know, arena, then I could totally see where if they did this type of uh, card, you know, allotment, that maybe there'd be some sort of complaint. But I think a lot of fans have it in their mind that they're like, oh, we're getting, like, strong style evolved level shows. It's like you're not looking – Look at the size of the buildings they're doing. It's like eight hundred to a thousand seat arenas. Yeah, and it's and you know what? Granted, that's I'm not absconding from or you know I'm not trying to apologize for New Japan and say hey they've got everything right. Yeah, they didn't announce the talent lists way in advance. That's something we've been very critical of on the show. I don't know what this is building to long term, and I think that they're still trying to work out the kinks and figure out what they're doing in America. So this is not perfect by any means and i know like for me personally i've seen new japan many times live and in person and when i saw the the card in tampa i was slightly disappointed but for a lot of fans locally who've never seen new japan when when are you going to be able to pay 35 dollars in your local area to see hiroshi tanahashi or kotobushi just wrestle right yeah so I think that there is some give and take. I think that there's some unrealistic expectations by certain fans here in the States uh, as to what these cards are. But if you take them at face value, you are getting a pretty awesome lineup. And I think it's I think it's uh, more than fair to say that we should hold off on the judgment before we, like, to actually see what, what uh, kind of product they bring to the States before we, like, um, you know, say like, oh, this is a failure. You know, they, they you know, I, I think that their uh, business model, personally, I think this business model is not going to work. I think without, t- yeah. without TV, and we've said it many times, the, the distribution model and the, the, the money in the States is all based on content for television. Let me ask you this, though, because even with the access deal. Well, it's gone. No, yeah, but like at the time. Yeah. I was a little confused about like, like, who is this for? Because, like, I never watched, you know, like, for, like, most of the hardcore fans, you're, you're subscribing to the network because you're wanting to watch stuff as soon as it goes up. You're, wanna, you're gonna watch, want to watch these full cards in the context of them being shows. With access, it kind of, like, chopped up the matches. And, right. like, I don't know. I guess it's good if you're, like, flipping through channels and you're casual. But, like, the fact that it's, like, a, a Japanese wrestling product is already pretty alienating to casuals so it's like i don't know it to I, me it always kind of confused me i would somewhat agree like but as somebody who started watching those access shows that that really was a gateway to me downloading world to begin with okay and the early shows were really like they started at wrestle kingdom i believe seven with the okada tanahashi feud and it wasn't until like last year that they really even got up to date. So it was sort of like a, a recap through history. And yeah, they did they did cut up some matches, but for the most part, the important big big matches, they usually showed them in full. And I think that like the fact that it was HD, it was English commentary, which also up until like the last couple of years, that wasn't always available on New Japan World. You know, so that that was the the big difference was like you'd watch World and you had primarily Japanese uh, commentary for the first couple years, and then you'd be able to watch on, uh, you know, Access TV and get Josh Barnett and get Mar Ronaldo and then later Jim Ross, and that was kind of a great thing. Uh, I, You know, I think it served its purpose. I think uh, at this point, obviously, it's kind of run its course because they're doing a better job almost on, um, on New Japan World, but I think the fact that they had a distribution system that probably got more people exposed to New Japan... Right. Uh, was was a really good thing and a really valuable thing, and it will be long term if they can do that again. So, so let me ask you this, because I, I I do agree that I think it was ultimately a good thing. I just I guess my my criticism was like they had the TV deal and it was 
all in all pretty good. It's not like they tried to like mess with the product. They kind of just took the product and tried to do right. their best to, like you said, introduce people to this where then you could hopefully be, you know, it's a gateway to signing up for New Japan World. Um, so all of that was, you know, I think that they did a good job with that. Um, I was just like, there's already kind of a ceiling to that mm-hmm. to a certain extent. Plus it's on access. Right. Where it's right. like, okay, it's, you know, a bunch of concerts and, right, yeah. and like it's a little unfocused. Yeah, but I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. Like, I think it was mainly like just drawing in either those people who are kind of flipping the channels. I mean, we've had friends who said like their friends have gotten into watching New Japan just by flipping, oh, like what's this on access? And right. Or if you're just right. like looking for, you're trying to get into New Japan, you're kind of iffy about subscribing to like a foreign, you know, streaming sure. service. It's like that was kind of an easy way to like get into things. Right. Yeah, they, they've done a better job over the years making New Japan World uh, sign up more accessible, but I, I signed up for it in the early days, and it was yeah. pretty difficult. Um, and you're right, there there is de- there was definitely a ceiling with that excess uh, you know deal. But, I mean, keep in mind a couple things. Number one, there's a reason why Anthem purchased the, the freaking network because, <laughs> you know, for their product, it, it ended up being a better thing all around, you know, and they're yeah. they're trying to piggyback off the success New Japan had, mm-hmm. and then because it was a private channel, we never really were able to get the the uh, hard numbers the same way you'd get with like Nielsen ratings. But from all reports, New Japan on Axis was by far the historical highest performing show they'd ever had, and up to that point, it was the Access TV fights that they'd had every single Friday night, and they were yeah. smoking Access TV mm-hmm. fights. I mean destroying it so it was a good thing for the time i mean but you're right they, they need a better distribution model right and also too um like that the access model is good kind of showing big matches but if they're going to be doing like all these new japan to america shows i think it would be great to use the american tv to kind of like highlight some of these shows that are happening yeah. here and be like hey we're coming to a city near you. This is what we had in Tampa and show like, you know, the big matches from each city right. throughout the weeks. And then as you build the next American tour, you kind of have that TV, that, that word of mouth going out there. So a couple of things um, I think we should just highlight and talk about uh, st- stuff that sticks out to you. So on this uh, Tampa card, the main event is a 10 man elimination uh, or 10 man tag elimination. That is my, f- one yeah, of, yeah, one your of favorite my match. favorite <laughs> match styles. <laughs> Uh, in New Japan, so I would have never dreamed in a million years that in St. Petersburg, Florida, that I'll be able to like just go watch an elimination style tag match from New Japan. Like that's that's crazy to me. It does seem like the Bullet Club versus um, you know uh, Seki Goon slash Chaos feud is kind of going to be the thing dominating most of the tour. We see that highlighted here on the first night. Um, anything else that kind of sticks out to you? Any of the talent announcements? Anything like that? Well, you know, it's very interesting. We've seen that uh, Tanahashi and Ibushi have kind of formed a tag team and are planning on challenging for the IWGP tag titles in the future. So it's interesting you have them kind of teaming with the current champions in Finjuice, and they're going against the former champions in G.O.D. So I f- thought that was kind of interesting. Um, very interesting, you know, Jeff Cobb on these shows. I know I had it in the news section, but... Uh, Cobb did not resign his Ring of Honor contract. He's kind of working. Unlike in- some other people. We'll get to that in the news. <laughs> yeah, so he's working independent. Like, he's still working Ring of Honor, but he's doing a per-date deal instead of a full-time contract. So, yeah. And we've all, we've always heard that Cobb's main goal has been do, to do more New Japan. So interesting to see him. And Alex Zane, who I I see the gifts all over Twitter. This guy is incredible. He wrestles in uh, GCW, Game Changer Wrestling. So it's going to be kind of great to see him on the show. And also, too, we're getting the dream team that we've, been kind of wanting for years now of Satoshi Kojima and Yuji Nagata. Yes, I saw that. We've been that. saying, you know, put Nakanishi yeah. to the side, put Tens onto the side, put Kojima and um, Nagata, Nagata together. And, like, so we're getting this team all throughout this tour, which is awesome. Yeah, and the thing with that is I understand where some people might look at these and they, they might say, well, what is this really building to? And it seems like the main thing is the tag team feud that you alluded to. With um, I don't I guess we call them the Golden Aces, yeah, <laughs> uh, versus Finn Juice and God. Um, that's kind of the thing dominating everything. But at the same time, Kojima and Nagata teaming up all throughout the tour. I gotta imagine they're probably gonna pick up a lot of wins. And with this being a canon show, 
I'm wondering how much that will play into the storylines going forward, whether that might help reinvigorate the tag team division if we do get a, a, a team of Kojima and Nagata, you know, racking up wins on this tour. Same thing with um, Colt Cabana and Toriano. I can't imagine they're going to be taking very many losses. So I think that this will be a way to, for them to kind of strengthen both of those tag teams going into the new year, basically. Right, yeah, just, you know, there's that emphasis on that tag division that everybody wants on. you you got Golden Aces. They're bringing back in uh, Cabana and Yano. They're putting Kojima and Naga together. So they're definitely, I think, trying to build that division for this year. Um, aside from that, um, you know, with their emphasis on um, New Japan and USA, you know, one big part of that is the L.A. Dojo. And we're seeing those young lines highlighted here. Clark Connors, uh, Ren Narita, uh, Carl Fredericks, and Alex Coughlin. Um, or is it Coughlin? Coughlin. Coughlin. Um, you know, all four of those guys are going to get a lot of valuable experience. And I've noticed that on the U.S. shows, they kind of give these guys a lot of time, a lot of experience. And we're even seeing some singles matches with some of them, um, which that's exciting. And if, if you haven't seen these guys work too much and you're going to be attending these shows, that's really something exciting to kind of look out for. Um, I think on the Nashville show, the match that really intrigues me the most is Kojima and Cobb. Oh, yeah, that's going to be a strong style fight right there. And and you're getting to see Tanahashi uh, work singles. Nagata and Archer probably be really good, too. So that's that's a good lineup. Um, on the Durham show, uh, Narita Arch, Archer's getting a lot of singles matches. And I'm, I'm guessing he's probably going to win most of those matches. So that will be a, a rebuilding sort of thing for him coming off the loss to John Moxley at Wrestle Kingdom as well. And then, um, obviously, we got the Rock and Roll Express kind of highlighted here. Uh, TJP, obviously, is also on these shows, so that's kind of exciting. Um, and then moving on to the last few nights, Miami and Atlanta, anything kind of stick out to you? I guess the big thing is Golden Aces and G.O.D., main eventing in Miami. Yeah, it's very interesting that um, that that's the main eventing in Miami, and then all, there's a title match the next day. Right. So if, like, G.O.D. loses, like, they're still getting a title match. They're coming in kind of weak. Yeah. So maybe there'll be like a fuck finish there. I don't know. Yeah. But that that's really yeah. That one's kind of uh, got but me questioning. Chad has got to do something, right? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. <laughs> and then the the main thing is in Atlanta. You're getting the uh, IWGB Tag Team Title main event with uh, Finn Juice and God. Um, I think Abushi and Owens will probably deliver, <coughs> and Cobb Archer also sounds pretty exciting. My one one of the big things that is a little gr- regretful was that. I was hoping some of the different feuds that were built up during uh, New Year's Dash might have played out right. and been part of this tour. You know, right? Yeah, it was like Evil Ishii or something like that. But we're, they saved all those angles primarily for the Japanese tour, which makes sense because that's their domestic audience. But I thought we'd get at least one of one those. One of those, things. yeah, yeah. But then uh, also, too, uh, if you guys are in the Tampa, St. Petersburg area, we are planning on having a New Japan fan meetup before the show. We haven't finalized the location yet, but as soon as we finalize the location and the time, it'll be all over our social media. We'll post it in the New Japan Reddit, anywhere we can post it. So if you're coming to that Tampa uh, show, you know, hit us up. We're planning on meeting up before a show, having a good time, hanging out. We will all be in attendance at the Tampa show. We are still working on our media credentials. Uh, you know, if any of you out there are listening, can help us out with that. <laughs> Hook your boys up. But uh, we're, we're we're talking to our people, and uh, I, I feel pretty good. I think we can get it done. Yeah. Even if we can't, we're gonna be there either yeah, way. Yeah, it'll be it'll be a fun show. I think yeah, everyone needs to put egos aside, put politics aside. <laughs> you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of good money to be made on all on all sides. Uh, <laughs> Any, any final thoughts from you guys uh, concerning the U.S. tour? No, I think we can move on to a new beginning in Sapporo. Josh, you want to take us to that February 1st card? Yeah, so February 1st, we have a tag team action opening up the show. El Fantasma and Taiji Ishimori taking on the team of Tiger Mask and Yuya Yamura. Um, after that, we have six-man tag action as Hiroshi, Hir, uh, Hiroshi Tenzan, Manabu Nakanishi, and Yota Suji take on the team of Togi Makabe, Toma Oki Hanma, and Toa Hanare. After that, we have eight-man tag action as Suzuki Goon, team of Zack Sabre Jr., El Desperado, Yoshinabu Kanemaru, and Doki uh, take on the Chaos team of Will Ospreay, Rapongi 3K, and Riazuki Taguchi. After that, there's a tag team match between 
Romu Takahashi teaming with Bushi, taking on the team of Ryu Lee and Robbie Eagles. And then Tetsuya Naito and Sonata will face Kenta and Jay White in tag team action. Kazushika Okada is teaming with the Death Rider, John Moxley, to take on Minoru Suzuki and Taichi. After that, singles action, big match here, Evil taking on Tomohiro Ishii. Um, and then the main event will be Hiroki Goto defending the Never Openweight title against Shingo Takagi. Man, that's, that's a pretty solid lineup right there. That's going to be a banger. Yeah. Uh, Takagi and, uh, and Goto. Yeah, this will be the third match that we've seen between uh, Hiroki Goto and Shingo Takagi. And every single time that these guys have uh, been in the ring with one another, it's been nothing but fireworks. Uh, I especially loved the G1 match that they had, which yeah. pr- produced one of the greatest uh, pumping bomber like Dude, that gifts ma- I've ever seen in my life. He closed on the soul out of Goto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... Yeah, they're strong boys for sure. It was great. Um, I can't wait for that match. <laughs> that's that's like my personal like. You know, I'm like super hyped for that match. Yeah, I I thought they did a fantastic job at New Year's Dash, just building up these top two matches that are going to be on night one of uh, Sapporo. Um, one of my favorite matches of that entire weekend, and so far I think the best tag team match by far in a long time in New Japan. So. Yeah, Goto Takagi, to me, that's got title change written all over it. Oh, yeah, dude. You need, they need to strap the rocket on a Shingo, you know, get the, get the money train going. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm seeing, you know, Last of the Dragon in uh, Goto's future. I can totally see why they would maybe keep the title on Goto. He is synonymous with the never open weight division at this point. And Shingo has held gold, but not singles gold as of yet in New Japan. Um. You know, he came up short against Goto in their, uh, I think they had essentially what, like a number one contenders match for the IC belt earlier this year. Right, yeah. To, yeah. to challenge against Jay White. Um, and, you know, Shingo, they're one on one against each other in singles action going into this match, but the never title changes hands so often. Right. I mean, Kanto is one of the first guys who had like multiple defenses last year. So, yeah. yeah, that title usually is a hot potato. And Goto's probably pretty much at this point slotted where he's going to be slotted. A win for him would definitely strengthen him because wins and losses matter. But Shingo, I think, is the guy that really benefits more from, you know, picking up the victory here. Goto got his big moment in the Dome, but I'm, I'm ready for Shingo to kind of, you know, take the helm and, and kind of be the defining guy in the Never division this right. coming year. I'm ready for the Shingo year-long, <laughs> never, right. you know, strong style title run. You never want to fuck the Shingo to God. <laughs> and, and, and he's he's probably not going in the, the juniors uh, tournament this year. No, right? he's he's Early declared heavyweight, yeah. So he's he's done with all that. So, yeah, you can put the Never belt. I, I know it's open weight, but usually, like, it's, it's usually not a junior holding that belt. So it's you can he can hold on to that belt. And we've had discussions in the past about the the open weight nature of the Never title, and we only really saw in the past a few (coughs) handful of times where guys have kind of, uh, you know, kind of flirted with that that open weight line. Very few, like, juniors have over the years kind of been invested or, you know, gone for that belt. But with Shingo kind of being, if he were to be the guy to win the belt. Yeah, he's perfect. He's a perfect person to where you can maybe heat somebody up from the junior division and, uh, make them a credible title challenger, and he'll work well with them because he's got uh, history with all those guys. Plus, there's a whole slew of new opponents for him, um, you know, in the heavyweight ranks as well. So I think that's the more exciting uh, direction to go. I could see why they might try to keep Goto strong with the, the momentum he's coming in with, but I, I think they need to go with Shingo. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, anything else kind of stick out to you guys here? Obviously, Evil and Ishii. Yeah, Evil and Ishii, you were getting that. They you know Del built up a part of that tag match. Uh, those guys had a great match at the beginning of last year as well, and they were some in the G one also, right? Yeah, yeah. So these guys, they always have phenomenal matches with each other. So I'm really looking forward. This night is going to be, you know, the yeah. strong style night with those those last two matches in the the main and semi main. Yeah, I think one big talking point for a lot of people is John Moxley teaming with Okada on that night. Um, we had questions when Moxley first came to New Japan. Which where would he fit in? Because he was in the G one, but that was mainly singles, and he was just teaming with uh, his personal young lion, Shooter Omino. And um, you know, people are like, "Well, he doesn't really fit in here. He doesn't fit in there. He's kind of an outsider." And on this tour, we're going to be seeing him um, even on the road to shows. 
primarily uh, teaming up with uh, Hantai or, or uh, Sekigun. And that kind of does make sense, but um, I think you can create some really interesting moments and maybe even some friction with the fact that he is an outsider. And I'm wondering what it's going to be like to see Okada Moxley on the same side. Right. I think there's definitely some tension you can kind of build there, especially set up a future Mox Okada match. You can kind of tease those guys not really working well together. And they're going up against Suzuki goons, uh, you know, Suzuki and Taichi. Those guys all in the same faction have plenty of experience working together. So you can kind of tell that story of Suzuki and Taichi kind of having the chemistry edge over Okada Moxley and also tease that Okada Moxley singles match Maybe Dominion or whenever they want to do it. Has, has Okada challenged for the U.S. title at all? No. He hasn't. The only so that would be a new thing for him then. He's only challenged for the IWGP title since returning from Excursion. Right. Um, well, so that's he, not true. He just challenged for the Intercontinental title. Um, well, right. Yeah, right. Well, double gold dash. Yeah, outside double gold dash, he's only been in IWGP heavyweight title matches. That, that, would, be an inter- that would be interesting. I'd be into that. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of this first night, we're seeing, uh, you know, building tag team matches for the uh, feuds on the rest of the tour. So, you know, with Okada and Tai Chi sort of embroiled in, in, <coughs> in a feud, we're going to see that later on. And then Moxley and Suzuki going head-to-head for the U.S. belt. Um, you know, when you first look at this, you might automatically say, well, Tai Chi's obviously taking the pinfall here. I'm not... I think that's the way probably they'll go, but, I mean... They really have built up Tai Chi as a strong uh, competitor, especially with him uh, taking on Okada. I'm not entirely convinced he's going to be take eating a pinfall in this match, dude. I they, if they want to, you know, really shock the world here, they could have Tai Chi beat Okada to really heat up that match and make you think Tai Chi has a chance of beating Okada in the singles match. Right. Yeah, I think there's an upset alert kind of uh, you know waiting in the in the whims that maybe people are not totally considering. Um, aside from that, we also have Naito and Sonata taking on Kenta and Jay White. Uh, obviously, Naito will be defending uh, both titles against Kenta. And then um, Sonata and Jay White is also an intriguing feud that was kind of built up at New Year's Dash. Right. So, obviously, you know, with Sonata pinning Jay White in that multi man match and then the post match attack, you know, Jay. Saying you know Sonata, you think you're all is great, and you know I'm gonna I'm gonna humble you. So getting that rivalry there, and then obviously with Kento, we talked about that, you know that that angle that you know that just had everybody's uh, blood boiling yeah. and attacking Naito. So they're they're building that up for the big um, new beginning in Osaka card in Osaka Joe Hall. Yep, and then um, I guess the last kind of really big ones to kind of talk about uh, Romu and Bushi teaming to take on. Ryu Lee and Robbie Eagles is very interesting. Obviously, uh, we know the history of Ryu Lee and Hiromu Takahashi. They're going to be facing off uh, later on the tour for the junior belt. But Robbie Eagles is the last man to have pinned Hiromu Takahashi um, going into the Dome. And I think a lot of people had expected him to be the automatic title challenger. So to kind of see him teaming with Ryu Lee here going up against Hiromu, I think there's a, a little bit of a story element there, a little bit of a breadcrumb. Right. I think they're trying to elevate him on the level of these guys all, you know, he's teaming up with a bunch of uh, former, he's in a match with a bunch of former IWGP junior <laughs> champions. So it's it's big for him being in this match, kind of elevating him to that level. And plus there's this, this story, like you mentioned, the last tag match, Eagles was the guy to pin Hiromu in that Road to Tokyo Dome show when they were um, going up against the Birds of Prey. So... Is a whole story. I mean, Eagles could pin Hiromu again, and then that leads into the whole story of of Eagles saying, "Hey, you know, I've pinned the champ twice. Where's my title shot? Why, why did Ryu Lee get a shot before I did when I was the one that last that last pinned Hiromu?" Yeah, absolutely. And then um, finally, the uh, eight man tag with uh, Chaos taking on um, Suzuki Goon. The two primary principal guys there are Will Osprey and Zack Saber Jr. And it seems as though, well, I think they just announced it, that Will Ospreay and Zack Sabre will be t- uh, facing each other for the Red Pro British Heavyweight title. Well, it's on uh, night two of New Beginning. And on so night far, two. Yeah. So this is a, that's a big preview match. And um, uh, let's, so let's go there. Let's talk about night two. You want to give us the rundown? Yep. So night two, New Beginning in Sapporo, Sunday, February 2nd. We'll have Toa Hanare versus Yotosuji, Tenzan, Nakanishi, and Tiger Mask versus Togi Makabe, Hanma, and Yuya Mora. El Fantasmo versus Gabriel Kidd, who will be making his debut from the LA Dojo. Hiroki Goto, Ishii, and Robbie Eagles versus Shingo, Evil, and Bushi. 
Moxley, Rapungi 3K, and Taguchi versus Suzuki, Desperado, Kanemaru, and Doki. Naito, Sonata, Hiromu versus Kenta, Jay White, and Taiji. And then the semi-main event will be Zack Sabre Jr. versus Will Ospreay for the Rev Pro British Heavyweight title. And then the main event of the evening will be Kazuchika Okada versus Tai Chi. Man, that's a that's awesome. Um, the first match I I just want to bring up there: Tohanari and Yoda Suji. Um, we've seen these guys go head to head before. I think it's safe to say that this is a match I always anticipate and always enjoy, but always delivers a little under where I think they should be. Yeah, as much time that these guys have been facing off, you would think they would have a little bit better chemistry by now, maybe a little bit more hard hitting matches, kind of like we saw with Toa Hanare when he was going up against Ishii. Because Toa Hanare is kind of in the Ishii role here, with Suji kind of in the, the Hanare role here. So, kind of expecting some of the similar fireworks, but not quite getting there. Maybe we'll get it in this match or in future matches. Yeah, after that, um, Phantasmo and Gabriel Kid is very interesting. Um, you know, like you mentioned, this is kind of Gabriel Kidd's introduction to the New Japan audience, and that's a big task uh, taking on El Phantasmo. Um, for all the criticism that I give him, this is a match that can really showcase whether or not he's able to kind of carry uh, someone who's a little bit greener into, you know, a, a great singles match. And, you know, I think that a lot of people are going to have their eyes on this match and kind of see what these guys have to offer. I'm not as familiar with Gabriel Kidd, but I know a lot of people like him a lot. Yeah, I haven't seen much Gabriel Kidd, but, like, yeah, I've heard good things about him. And, you know, obviously he's been in the L.A. Dojo system, under Shibata system. We've seen what Fredericks and Coughlin and Connors look like. So I'm sure he's going to be great out there. And then um, I think it's interesting the next night we have uh, Goto and Ishii in six-man tag action against uh, Shingo and Evil, which this is always kind of the awkward thing that you get <laughs> with New Japan where – the guys that were in the big singles matches still get kind of faced off in ultimate matches after the the blow off to their feud. So, uh, kind of interesting to see where they kind of go with the story from that point. Once you know those feuds have kind of been settled, I suppose. Right. But um, you know, Moxley teaming up with uh, Seki Goon or or Chaos, like we talked about earlier, taking on Suzuki and um, and all that. That's one to keep your eyes on. Um, but the two big matches here. Zack Sabre Jr. and Will Ospreay for the Rep Pro British Heavyweight title. I just looked this up. Will Ospreay in his entire time has never held the Rep Pro title. Oh, wow. Um, I do think he's held the cruiserweight belt, if I if I recall correctly. But he's I know he's challenged. Hey, he's a tag champ too, right? Yeah. Hey. But I don't think he's ever held the, uh, the British Heavyweight title uh, from Rep Pro. And Zack Sabre is pretty much the perennial, you know, Longest reigning, most defenses. Like, he's the top champion in the history of that company. Um, and these guys have a long history, some really, really great matches. The most recent one was the one that they had during the G1, which kind of went a little unnoticed with how great that uh, G1 block was. But that match really was incredible. Yeah, I love um, Osprey and Sabre matches. They have such, you know, opposite wrestling styles that just clash together to make great matches. Every Sabre Osprey match I've seen has been great, and so I'm really looking forward to this matchup here. My favorite match they ever had was uh, WrestleMania weekend at the uh, WWN WN Super, Show? Super Show. Yeah, from I think it was 2015, 2016. And that was a match of the year candidate. It was like four and three quarters, almost five stars, 15 minutes. One of the best wrestling exhibitions you'll ever see. But where that match was interesting was that it was a contrast of styles. Whereas the match they had during the G1 was a straight up classic technical wrestling match. Yeah. That was Osprey saying like, "Oh, I can I can wrestle this style." The Check British style. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it was incredible. So, um I'm wondering if we we see more of heavyweight Will here. Um and he can kind of I'm I'm guessing to be honest with you, they could go with Will Osprey, but with Zack kind of being their guy, I I don't know that they take the title off of him here. Right. I think they they, they might hold it on Zack until they get a Rev Pro guy kind of ready for it. But then again, Will kind of technically is a rep pro guy, and we know that he's talked about wanting to help reinvigorate the British. Save Brit Russ. <laughs> Save Brit Russ. So, um, you know, that's that that one's going to be a banger. And, I mean, it, who knows? It could be the match of the tour. And then, uh, finally, Okada Taichi. I, I think a lot of people are kind of scratching their heads. Well, I mean, what are your guys' thoughts on yeah, that? What do you think about this one, Jamie? Um, I think Taichi's got a lot to prove. 
going into that. Uh, I think he's like, he has had a lot of, um, he's impressed a lot of people in the last year, two years or so. You know, because before that, it was just like, oh my God, another Tai Chi match. And he's like really kind of turned things around. So now it's like people are kind of like with him. So now it's like, okay, here's a big singles against Okada. Like, like I think he's like, he needs to take it up to even up a notch further than where he's already at. And, uh, I mean, Okada never has a bad match. So, like, <laughs> I think it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. I want to I want to be able I want to see if uh, if they're able to just steal the show that week. Um, yeah, I think the thing with Tai Chi that's interesting. He's quite a bit older than Okada. He's like thirty nine, and uh, Okada's thirty two. But if I recall correctly, they came into the company around the same time. And i I even remember. And if I'm incorrect, you know, someone can correct me. But I think they even like used to travel together. Well, there's a picture floating around somewhere there's on Reddit of, of like young Tai Chi and young Okada together. There's a ton of pictures. Like, like there's more That's to the cool. story than just them, you know, just what's <coughs> occurred at this most recent uh, New Year's Dash. And, you know, for a guy like Tai Chi, who's kind of like, he's not a dojo guy. He kind of came up from a different system and has really only recently in the past year or two kind of gotten to the, the level to where he's even believable against a guy like Okada. Like you said, Jamie, he's got a lot to prove. This is one of the biggest tasks he's ever had. Right. But if we know anything about Okada, he's able to get the best out of opponents more so than I would say almost any other modern wrestler today. So for those who are probably like wary of this, this might actually shock and surprise you that this could be good. That being said, we, we do this all the time with Tai Chi, and then they come out, and they fuck off, and they do all the interference. and Iron Claw, Iron Mike, Claw Stan, Mike Stan, Mio Abe, Brawling Kanamaru, Man. Desperado. Yeah. <laughs> so there's there's always the chance. We saw last year during the New Beginning, we thought the uh, Naito match was going to be a classic, and it ended up kind of uh, being a very divisive match based on how they booked that. So I don't know, but it's the main event. It's a big spot. Uh, I can't remember the last time Tai Chi was in a main event spot. Did him and Ishii main event something, or that, that was just? I don't know, but this is this is a big task for him. So, um, yeah, and you know, with the Okada redemption storyline, if he were to take a loss to Taichi here, that would be a huge shakeup. Let me let me, let me ask you this, um, because I don't I don't see them repeating the kind of like lost Okada storyline, you know, from 20, I don't either twenty eighteen. So like, yeah, you know, like what do they, what do they do with Okada this year, like? Is it right back into the title picture immediately? Uh, my my thing, and maybe they don't go this way, but I think there's a really interesting story to be told if you wanted him to hypothetically go for the icy belt. Like, he could say, I underestimated the value of this prize. I was too, uh, you know, cocky, too, too full of myself. And this is a, a mountain that I've never really climbed, and I want to prove that I'm the best and, you know, look at the names that have held this belt, and I'm going to go for it, basically. And you could kind of do like a, a John Cena 2015 U.S. title esque sort of thing with with Okada, and kind of you know it's interesting. You kind of got Tanahashi and Ibushi tied up in the tag team uh, division, and then you could do something really really interesting if you keep Okada tied up, you know, uh, for not forever, but maybe five months, six months in the IC title uh, division, and that kind of. Uh, clears the log jam in the in the IWGP title picture and then when it when the appropriate time comes maybe after the G1 or something bring Okada back into the fold you know what i mean right yeah i, I think that'd be really interesting so you're thinking those those double belts split up pretty early on in the year then i do okay and and you know what uh we're, we'll talk about it but uh, Naito has even gone on and said he's never going to defend both belts Simultaneously after this match, right? Okay. Yeah, the the post uh, press conference they had after Wrestle Kingdom, he said, or after they announced this Osaka match, he was like, "Yeah, I'm only go if people want a title shot, they have to pick which belt they want." Okay, said, I'll defend both on one night if I have to, but the Kenta match will be the last time I'm doing both belts in one night. That makes sense in one match. So the last interesting thing before we talk about the big show in Osaka, there's a Never Trios title match on February 6th at Cork and Hall during the Road to uh, New Beginning uh, with the new champs Evil, Bushi, and Shingo Takagi um, taking on the team of Goto, Tomohiro Ishii, and Robbie Eagles, which actually, that match looks really great. Yeah, like, you know, the Never Six-Man titles, a lot of times, depending on who it's on, it kind of gets forgotten, obviously, with Yano, Cabana, 
and uh, Makabe. We really didn't see those guys defend the belts much of last year. And, you know, not a lot of what they did wasn't really great matches. So with a solid team with LIJ holding the belts, you know, Evo Bushi and Shingo going up against Goto Ishii and Robbie Eagles, I think that's, you know, going to be a solid defense. And they could really kind of revive these titles or if this is a type of matches and the type of teams that we're going to see this year. Yeah, I'd like to see those belts mean a little bit more <laughs> than where they've been. Like, usually you kind of like, uh, you know, like, was it the Taguchi team was holding on to it? Right, for, yeah, Taguchi, Makabe, and Yano, yeah. Yeah, it was like for months, and you, you kind of forget that they're there. So it'd be, it, it'd be, I, I want them to see do something. Yeah. Yeah, my, my <laughs> whole thing with this is, like you mentioned, Jeremy, they've treated this belt almost like a afterthought and a joke in the past. And I don't think it needs to be elevated. I think having it on guys like these stars from LIJ, the, the, the thing is, um, going back about two years, the most relevant the six-man titles have ever been to me was when it was held by Sonata, Evil, and Bushi. Yeah. Right, yeah. And since then, it's kind of fallen by the wayside. And I think that they have an opportunity here for at least one night to have a really good match in Cork and Hall main event, Goto, Ishii, and Eagles. And obviously that's going to be a, um, you know, that's that that's going to be really cool. So, and actually that's, so that's February 6th. So that's after the, um, that's going to be after the matches between um, Evil and Ishii. Okay, so, yeah. So what I was talking about earlier when I was saying like, you know, it's interesting to see where they take the, uh, the feud between those guys. I guess it's all going to kind of culminate in this February 6th uh, Road 2 show. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, great. So that brings us to New Beginning in Osaka, which will be happening on Sunday, February 9th. We got Nakanishi, Tenzan, and Kojima taking on Nagata, Makabe. No, oh, they're with Nagata. Oh, my bad. Yeah, Nakanishi, Tenzan, Kojima, and Nagata versus Makabe, Hanma, Tohanara, and Risuke Taguchi. Then we got Rapungi 3K versus El Desperado and Kanamaru for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team titles. We have Finn Juice, Kota Ibushi, and Tanahashi versus G.O.D., Yujiro and Chase Owens, Okada and Osprey versus Saber and Taichi. Then we got Sonata versus Jay White in a special singles match. Then we have Hiromu Takahashi versus Ryu Lee for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight title. John Moxley versus Minoru Suzuki for the IWGP United States title. And then we have Tetsuya Naito versus Kenta for the IWGP Heavyweight title. Yeah. This is a stacked card. Stacked card. They got to fill up that Osaka Joe Hall building, and I think this is a card. I think this card can get it done. It's kind of like a mini Dominion. Like, it kind of rivals Dominion, <laughs> like, like the way that this card is stacked. It's it's pretty insane. Um, it's pretty exciting, like, this close to, to the January 4th shows. Like, it's like we're immediately going into just another gigantic show. Yeah. Um, or set of shows. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, and, you know, it makes sense because it's Osaka Joe Hall. You know, if, it, if they weren't doing this from Osaka Joe Hall, then maybe we wouldn't get this kind of level of, of card. But, like, this is a huge, ambitious task. One thing I noticed was, you know, last year coming out of the Dome when they announced all the cards and the dates, we were like, holy crap, this is one of the most ambitious years, uh, you know, venue-wise that New Japan has ever tried to do, which really kind of goes against their uh, business model in the past because it's a very conservative company. We didn't see so much of that this year, but this is one of the outliers from that where they're doing, you know, the new beginning in Osaka. <laughs> in the past, I would always say that this was like maybe a, I wouldn't call it a C-level show, but maybe a B-minus level show. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Uh, but, you know, now it, they've really elevated. And, I mean, this this is a stacked card. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah, we got, what, three singles matches, three singles title matches. We have a, a junior tag team title match, and we got that singles match with Sonata and Jay White. You got that dream team of Okada and Osprey going to be in action. There's a lot of great things to really uh, sink your teeth in with this card. So a couple things that, uh, that stick out to me right off the bat. So the opening match, uh, you've got all the uh, third-generation dads teaming up to take on, um, you know, Makabe Hama, Hanari, and Taguchi. This is very significant because, and we're going to cover it in the news, but Nakanishi has announced his retirement. So I'm guessing that this is a really, this is going to be a really cool match because it'll be the last time you see all four of the guys that are still around from that generation uh, teaming up for, you know, one last stand in a big, this will be the last big 
like show match for Nakanishi, basically. Right, and it'll be uh, Nakanishi's last time in Osaka Joe Hall. Yeah. So, yeah, it'll be a big moment for him. So that's going to be cool. Then you've got the junior tag team titles on the line when Rapongi 3K defend against Desperado and Kanemaru. Match 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> it's a match we've seen many, many times. Uh, they 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 have had some good matches. In fact, I, I did really enjoy some of the matches they had during the... Uh, Junior Tag League this past year, but overall I'm I'm kind of over this uh, matchup. But who knows? They might they might surprise us here. Although, if history tells us anything, I wouldn't be shocked if uh, Suzuki Goon just takes the right. We can the get end. a title change, much like the Never Titles. I feel like the Junior Titles kind of bounce around throughout the year. Uh, so yeah, I could easily see Desperado and Kanemaru lifting these things off for Punky 3K. Interesting fact for you, gentlemen. Did you know? And I think Jeremy probably knows, but Rapongi 3K has only successfully defended the, the IWGP Junior Tag Team titles one time ever. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I, uh, it sounds crazy because it seems like they've had it forever, right? right? Yeah. You know, and so um, I think one, one thing that people are waiting for them to do is have a defining title reign, which they are yet to have done. So maybe this is the start of that, but... Could be. You know... I, this is this is their I would say of all the teams that they face this is their most storied rival um, and the hardest task that they've ever had in front of them is Desperado and Kanemaru. So it'll be really interesting to see how you know how they kind of handle this challenge. Yeah, it's going to be yeah, like you said, it's, e- it's either going to be the start of their junior tag team legacy or just kind of the same old kind of flipping the belt. So I think the near falls in this match are probably going to be really great because of that because you're expecting. You know, the Satori, uh, the whiskey surprise, whatever he calls it, um, you know, the miss. Satori special. Yeah, Satori special. Uh, you know, Bush or Desperado with the low blows into, like, the cradles that he does. So I think there's going to be a <coughs> lot of great near falls in this match. And you're kind of thinking, oh, Suzuki Gun's going to kind of pull it out. And then maybe Rapunky 3K will kind of get the win here. The next interesting thing is uh, in this eight-man tag, we've got Finn Juice teaming up with the Golden Aces to take on uh, the Bullet Club team of Yujiro Chase and G.O.D., and we're going to have seen um, on the road to, or on the uh, New Japan USA tour, many combinations of these guys going head-to-head. Tanahashi taking on Ujiro, Kota Bushi against Chase, and then uh, G.O.D. will have faced both of these tag teams prior to this taking place. Now, we don't know who will actually be holding the uh, IWGB tag team ch- uh, titles by this point, whether it's Finjuice or G.O.D., but with Kota Ibushi and Tanahashi's allusions to wanting to challenge for that belt, there's some very interesting dynamics here. Um, my guess is that Finjuice are going to retain, and then we're going to go into this match with the Golden Aces kind of wanting a shot at those belts, so maybe there will be some um, friction between, between those two teams going into this eight-man. Right, yeah, I think we're going to see something similar to what we saw at New Year's Dash, where the team will probably get the win, and then afterwards... Abushi and Tana will be like, all right, where's our title shot? I, my one thing is, given the history of how they book the uh, titles, I'm wondering if it culminates in some sort of triple threat tag team title. But I don't, I don't know. That just seems so weird to have Abushi and Tanahashi tied up in a, um, you know, in a three way for the titles with guys that are kind of below their station in terms of uh, the pecking order. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Bull Club actually picks up the win here to kind of solidify the divide in communication between these two teams on, on the on the uh, face side, considering that they already won during uh, New Year's Dash. I think that they're going to have issues, and this might be the catalyst for their uh, title challenge, honestly. Yeah, I could, yeah, I could definitely see that as well. Um, obviously, Okada and Osprey taking on Saber and uh, Taichi. <coughs> that will kind of be the follow-up to the matches that we saw previously. But let's talk about the big four matches here. So let's start with Sonata and Jay White. Yeah, so Sonata and Jay White, like we mentioned, after New Year's Dash, um, they lost that tag match. Um, Sonata and Naito defeated Jay White and Kenta. Then, of course, Kenta and Jay White attacked both men after the match, and Jay White really zeroed in on Sonata because Sonata was the one that pinned pinned him. And he was kind of saying, you know, Sonata, I'm going to humble you and prove that you're not as good as you say you are. So, obviously, Jay White had his eyes set on Sonata here. And it's going to be a big match for Sonata. You know, we've, we've seen last year Sonata started to get that elevation with that feud with Okada and just kind of the way they've been pushing him in the New Japan Cup and just 
all the different singles opportunities he had. He had a big singles match with Sabre at the Dome. So we're continuing to see um, Sonata being featured in high-profile matches on big shows in big arenas. So he's facing here a former IWGP champion. So if Sonata is able to get a win here, I think that kind of elevates him up the line in a potential tile shot, which could be against Naito. It's interesting because Sonata was so elevated last year given, you know, the feud that he had with um, Okada for the IWGP title, allusions to a future match between them for that belt, again, you know, kind of, uh, you know, sit in the memories of many fans. Uh, But with him coming off of a loss from Zack Sabre, he's kind of on the, you know, downturn a little bit. And Jay White's sort of in the same boat. Uh, You know, he did defeat uh, Kota Ibushi, but he lost his, his IC title to Naito, and we kind of had thought that that match between him and Ibushi would be an automatic number one contender match uh, for this exact show. And it obviously didn't turn out to be that way. So both guys have kind of been, uh, you know, lowered on the card just slightly. So it's a bit of a crossroads match. Right, yeah. And it's a fresh matchup that we haven't really seen too much of when it comes to Sonata and Jay White. And, you know, it's interesting to see what kind of chemistry they're going to have with one another. Uh, if we're going to get the Jay White special with all the shenanigans and the interference and all that, Sonata is able to kind of overcome that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> this is a match that I think some people think could hypothetically be bad, given the fact that Sonata usually wrestles to the level of his competition, and sometimes Jay White needs to wrestle up to the level of the guys that he's wrestling. Right. And so the, this kind of, um, for a lot of people, has the the, the potential to be like, a disappointing match at the same time with Jay White's heel antics this might be the very thing that Sonata needs to kind of get even more fan support uh you know coming into this match with that face sort of um you know dynamic Jamie what are your thoughts on this match yeah I mean we talked a, a little bit about you know the test for Tai Chi and that we, as you were just, just describing this scenario for Sonata and even Jay White in some ways it's like this almost is like much bigger test, uh, more more or less because, like you said, you know, Jay White's got probably the, the most heel tendencies, except for, I guess, maybe Kenta at this moment. But, for, you know, as far as a character goes, he's the biggest heel in the company. And uh, Sonata, as they're kind of grooming as, like, this, the next generation big baby face, he's already pretty over with the crowd. Um, the um, So, like, having him take on a very clear heel... He's a very clear uh, babyface in this role, although, like you said, he he doesn't really sh- he's not the best at really emoting. In his, you know, he's gotten much better, but that's kind of always been a weakness with him. So, like it'll it will be interesting to see like kind of the, the someone who's super stone face versus someone who's known for putting the most character work for a New Japan uh, <laughs> wrestler. So, I, it's an it's a really interesting dynamic, and like you said, it could absolutely suck and be boring, but. I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping they, they can really pull it out and, and make something, uh, like, just pull something completely uh, unexpected from, from both of them. So I'm really looking forward to that. Right. And, and because it's not, you know, the semi-main event or the main event, uh, I'm thinking we might see a little bit less shenanigans. So obviously you want to give yeah. time to those three big singles title matches. Um, so I think we might get a little bit more of a straightforward match here. Obviously, you know, uh, Gator will still be involved somehow. But I would like to see Sonata kind of push the pace here, kind of similar way he did with Zack Sabre in their series, and kind of wrestle that more technical wrestling style and kind of force Jay White to kind of wrestle him. And then Jay having to, you know, keep up with Sonata and then kind of maybe cheating at the last second to get the, the upper hand. Yeah, that's that's what he's the best at is, is that highly technical style. So Yeah, so yeah, if Sonata could push the pace here, I think we could be in for a pretty good matchup here. And then the next matchup um, is one of the most storied rivalries in the last, <laughs> like, five years of professional wrestling. Hiromu Takahashi defending the IWGP Junior Heavyweight title against the challenger, Ryu Lee. Yeah, so, obviously, you mentioned, yeah, these guys have had historic rivalry. And, also we had, you know, two years ago with... Uh, Ryu Lee accidentally breaking Hiromu's neck with that uh, that Phoenix Plex on that U.S. show, and so obviously there's a lot of history between these guys. 
um, from their time in Mexico and then the few interactions they've had in New Japan and the broken neck. So there's a lot of going into this match, um, a lot of story. Hiromu handpicked Ryu Lee to be his first challenger here. And so they've kind of been playing it straight as far as these guys still having mutual respect for each other and it's kind of being, you know, a good old competition between two great wrestlers. But I'm wondering within this match if we're going to see some heat from Hiromu and wanting to kind of pick things up and getting some, a little bit of revenge from Ryu Lee breaking his neck. This match has such a storied, like, history. Um, it goes all the way back to 2014 when uh, Hiromu Takahashi was wrestling under the name Kamatachi. He was uh, still during, uh, you know, in his excursion as a young wrestler in the CMLL promotion. He was wrestling under a mask. And him and Dragon Lee were coming up as two of the hottest young wrestlers. Most people didn't know who they were. They really made their name internationally facing against one another. Uh, Career to date, they have 18 singles matches. And Dragon Lee is the one who's leading that rivalry with 12 victories over uh, Hiromu Takahashi's six victories. Um, You know, they had lightning matches in uh, Mexico. (laughs) They had a long storied feud for the CMLL World Light Heavyweight or Lightweight title, trading that back and forth. Um, Dragon Lee was actually the one who took um, Hiromu Takahashi's mask and also took his hair uh, in two Lucha de Espuetas matches. And then, um, you know, they went from there to Ring of Honor, had a pay per view match there, and then all over Japan having multiple matches, and like you mentioned, the most recent one was the fateful night in the Cow Palace when um, Hiromu Takahashi was victorious in his IWGP title defense, or junior title defense, but he still ended up, you know, having that career-threatening, um, you know, neck break. And these guys are almost, like, very, it's, it's at this point, like, frenemies. Like, they, right. they, they have a lot of admiration. They have a lot of respect for one another. I would have liked to have seen this, been like a blood feud based off the fact, you know, the old school wrestling fan of me because of the neck break and the injury and everything like that. I think that it, it might have been better served to have, uh, you know, heat behind it and revenge. But that only seems to be a subtle undertone to what this match actually is. And it's, you know, the, the career rivalry between these two guys kind of dominates the story between them. Um, I mean, Jeremy, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I... I, I kind of uh, I'm kind of into like what they're do like the whole frenemies angle. It's it's something different. Um, you don't really see it done very well in rest in pro wrestling. So like, as much as yeah, I, I'd like to see that blood feud. I think like because of their history and because of the, I guess um, the, the physicality in their matches. That to me that's kind of enough. I don't really need that like hatred angle. Especially you know they they were just teaming up. Yeah, Dragon Lee, Ryu Lee, uh, you know, during uh, Hiromu's injury was out there, you know, paying all of his respects to him. To for them, it would be it almost be kind of weird to me if they just suddenly are like, oh, we hate each other now. Like, I, I don't know. So I, I'm kind of enjoying like what they're do- what they're doing with this, uh, and um, I, I I don't really need much else, I guess, to get me hyped on that match. I think what what needs to happen here is they need to book it as. Los Ingobernables de Japón versus uh, La Faction La Faction de Ingobernable. De Ingobernable. <laughs> oh. And uh, the loser doesn't get to use the uh, Ingobernable <laughs> gimmick any longer. <laughs> yeah, you do, you do got that kind of weird factor there with you know, uh, Dragon Lee being a part of Rusha's LIJ and Ring of Honor, and then obviously Hiromu being a part of the New Japan Los Ingobernables. So you got that interesting kind of factor there. And obviously with uh, Ryu Lee being under New Japan contract for this year, I'm guessing this is going to be first of many matches they'll probably have throughout this calendar year. So this could probably be the match that kind of is like the catalyst of their feud this year. And maybe things get a little bit too intense right. towards the end of this match. And that leads to a series of matches where things get a little bit more serious and a little bit more um, intense and violent. The interesting thing here is that in the past, even though Dragon Lee is leading the uh, the feud and career victories between the two of them, um, and I think he actually has more victories over Hiromu, even in New Japan, believe it or not, 
um, or they might be they might be tied. I'd have to take a look. But the interesting thing is when the title is on the line. Hiromu has beaten him twice in ti- successfully in title defenses for the IWGP junior title. All the victories that um, Dragon Lee holds over him are in best of the super juniors action in New Japan. So this, um, you know, really he had a really fantastic uh, title run last year. Um, you know, really, really great junior run. But these two guys, you know, we're it's 2020, we're in the Reiwa era. And when you talk about feuds of the decade, quote-unquote, this has to be considered one of the top at least 15, maybe even top 10 feuds from in-ring action story and standpoint of the last decade. I mean, there are almost no other two guys, especially considering, quote-unquote, junior wrestling, that have been able to have as many great matches against one another or even redefine a genre of wrestling the way that these two guys, whether it be Lucha, whether it be, you know, Puro Junior Wrestling, like every match they've ever had against one another is outstanding. And I don't expect this to be anything other than that. Uh, it's going to be, and plus with the uh, neck break angle, it's, or not angle, but the the <laughs> neck break that happened, it's going to be highly emotional. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely see them teasing that spot and kind of getting the cat, the crowd uh, gasping as they get ready to hit that. And then I'll see Hiromu will probably reverse it. Here's the crazy thing. Hiromu, they might tease it, but Hiromu's... Th- the only person out there that's probably crazy enough to maybe still take it again. Right, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, kind of prove like his neck is good and that, that first time was kind of a fluke. But I think Hiromu's going to take the win here. Yeah, I would expect Hiromu to end up retaining here as well. After that, we have the semi-main <laughs> event, a highly anticipated match. Uh, John Moxley defending the IWGP United States title against the king, Minoru Suzuki. And... Uh, Fun fact, this is the first time a Japanese wrestler has challenged for the IWGP United States title since its inception. Wow. The only other Japanese wrestler to ever compete for it was Tomohiro Ishii in the Ishii. tournament finals against uh, you Kenny also Omega. F- also forgetting Yoshihashi competed for it as oh, well man. on the Ring of Honor show against Kenny Omega. You know what? You're right. I always forget <laughs> I always forget that. <laughs> Yoshihashi is very forgettable, so everybody <laughs> will understand. That match was actually pretty good, though. Um, but, yeah, so we've got Moxley and Suzuki. I think this is a match that people have been clamoring for yeah. ever since Moxley came to New Japan. Uh, it was one of the biggest, uh, you know, regrets of people that were like, why isn't Suzuki in the G1? Why isn't he in the same block as as Moxley? When are we getting this dream match? And it's finally happening. I mean, this match has been hyped since the photos with Moxley at Bloodsport watching Suzuki, remember that was that might have been. I was been there. Before. Yeah, I was literally like, I, I, won't, was, I didn't. No one said anything to him, but I was standing right there, and I was like, uh, is Dean Ambrose here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, so yeah, this is. Um, I'm so stoked on this match when the you know that night two Wrestle Kingdom and, and Suzuki coming out and for that challenge, and people thought that was just going to be a match like on the spot, like oh we're doing this right now. So, so did I. He was in his yeah, ring yeah, gear came, and everything. Came out, ripped the gear off, and was ready to run it. That was an insane moment, um, and it all makes sense of like, because I I was like fully bought in on those rumors of Suzuki not sticking around. You know, he's like okay, he's Zach's coming out, not like to the his theme. Uh, Suzuki's there, but he's not really there. He didn't right. really and do then, much in that match. And in the post match from night one, it was just um, Saber, Desperado, and Taichi. Yes, yeah, Suzuki yeah. wasn't even didn't even show up to the press conference. So I'm wondering if like we all just got worked and they're putting out well, Suzuki's done New Japan rumors. Well, those those rumors came from a pretty credible source at the time so i don't know how true they were or if things have maybe changed you know wrestling changes a lot but um i'm glad that suzuki is still sticking around oh same and you know him and him and mox have been angling for this match ever since they started uh talking about one another in uh interviews and on social media and so it's not it's not just the most recent uh events that occurred during wrestle kingdom and new year's dash although that has really hyped Everything for everybody. I was at the point where I thought hypothetically Suzuki might be leaving too, and with John Moxley trying to work so hard to uh, have a match at Bloodsport, I was like, oh, yeah, they're gonna do that WrestleMania weekend. But totally. I'm, but I'm glad they're not doing it because it's too big of a match to kind of throw away. Even though I love Bloodsport, you know, it makes way more business sense for New Japan to capitalize on this match now. Absolutely. And um, you know, we're gonna. Mm-hmm. 
for everyone who's always like, well, you know, is Moxley just, you know, I've heard some people say like, you know, Moxley's not so different from Dean Ambrose and, you know, the, it's just, he's just dressing different and allowed to flip the bird and say different things, but he's pretty much the same guy. I don't agree with that sentiment, but for those people who, who have that opinion, you're going to see something completely and wholly unique when it comes to Moxley and Suzuki. Yeah. Because you don't get to have a WWE-esque match when you take on Minoru Suzuki. Right. This is going to be a strong style, hard-hitting submission style. It's, pr- it's going to be a, probably a blood sport um, style of matchup. And the thing I love about this, too, is just like the elevation we're seeing here of the U.S. title. You know, the U.S. title started off in a great place with Kenny Omega, but, you know, it kind of bounced around to Jay White, Juice Robinson, Cody Rhodes. And so kind of, uh, you know, more of a mid-card status. Now we're having, you know, one of the top guys in the business right now, John Moxley, holding the title and kind of elevating that and, you know, facing off challenge, you know, defending the title against Minoru Suzuki, you know, very, you know, you can say what you want about Suzuki and just the history he's had in Japanese wrestling, all the companies and titles he's held. So the prestige of the U.S. title is kind of being raised here at this match. From a style standpoint, Moxley, you know, a deathmatch guy, a guy that is known for his brawling antics and style, sort of almost akin to like a Bruiser Brody or something of that nature. And then you have Minoru Suzuki, who's no stranger to that, but obviously it's his, you know, technical wrestling acumen his shoot style uh wrestling that he kind of brings to the table and these are two worlds that both guys dabble in but if you had to give the edge to one competitor suzuki's the more obviously he's he's one of the like godfathers of mma he's one of the godfathers of shoot style wrestling that's something that john moxley loves and it you know is a aficionado of but i wouldn't say you could put him at the top level. I actually thought when they said when he was going to wrestle John, Josh Barnett, I was like, I mean, Josh Barnett in a, in a shoot match is going to destroy John Moxley, <laughs> you know? But um, John is really trying to incorporate more of that into his game. And on the flip side, you Minoru Suzuki is always brawling on the outside, using chairs. Uh, it's been one of the things that some people have even criticized. Like, at this stage of his career, he can't have a match without going out there and using a chair, going out there using the guardrail or, or what have you. But it's going to be interesting because Suzuki, in my opinion, cannot match John Moxley when it comes to the outside brawling. And, that, and I wouldn't say that about most people because Suzuki is, is one of the best, but yeah. Moxley's at a different level when it comes to that sort of wrestling. Right, and I think, too, a lot of people might, might be surprised by that statement because you know, a lot of Suzuki gun matches are them kind of brawling on the outside, but it's more kind of a walk and brawl on Suzuki just kind of throwing stuff on people. Um, I think Suzuki's better off. His, his strength is in the ring and right. at wrestling. Yeah. And, and, and this is more from a kayfabe standpoint. Right. From a kayfabe, that's John Moxley's wheelhouse. And on the other end of things, I think Moxley is going to be prideful and want to try to prove that he's able to go blow for blow with a guy like Suzuki, which is a fool's errand, or go hold for hold with a guy like Suzuki, or, or trade submissions. And um, I think it really just matters to which guy is able to get the other guy to wrestle his style. Um, I think that that was the undoing of Ishii in the Moxley match during the G1, that Ishii was able to draw Moxley to his style of wrestling, but Moxley really solidified that match and the win by getting Ishii to go all over the arena with him and incorporate tables and fight on the outside. And um, I think it really just matters which guy is able to implement their game plan better than the other guy, not let the other one draw them into their wheelhouse. So yeah. I think Suzuki's winning the title here. Mm. I think the main reason is for partially political reasons. We've talked about John Moxley being unable to defend the U.S. title in America. We know Minoru Suzuki is one of the biggest draws internationally that New Japan has, whether it be in America, whether we've seen it on U.S. shows, whether it be there or even in the U.K., Um, he's one of the few guys that has more cachet than some of the traditional bigger stars. I think, if you want my honest opinion, in some cases, Suzuki might be a bigger deal sometimes in the States than guys that have been seen here less, like a Tanahashi or an Okada, believe it or not. He's one of the few, he's one of the few guys that kind of is elevated beyond just like pro wrestler. You know, he's got kind of that legend status. legend status. He's got that shoot fighter appeal, which is pretty rare these days um, at like a level of pro wrestling that Minoru Suzuki is. He's got like 
So, like, that's a huge appeal in the West for sure. It's like, oh, this guy's a, a legit badass, you know. Yeah, and I think for those reasons, um, you know, we talked about how we hypothetically thought things were going to turn out at Wrestle Kingdom with the U.S. title. And when we talked about Moxley being unable to defend it in the States, we were like, well, he's definitely going to drop it to Juice. Obviously, we were wrong on that. But at this point, I think Suzuki makes all the sense in the world to be the IWGP U.S. T- champion. And if a guy the, the level of star that John Moxley is probably was like, I'm going to drop the title to someone who's deserving of it from a business perspective – on both ends, Suzuki's probably the guy to beat Moxley, and it doesn't hurt Moxley. And I think that that's the difference with maybe, say, like Juice or Archer, where that might have lowered him. Losing to Suzuki doesn't lower you, you know what I mean? So right. I think Suzuki's going to hit him with the gotch style uh, pal driver in one, two, three. So you make a great case there, Josh, but I'm going on the opposite side. I think John Moxley is going to retain the title. I think that we've seen that they don't have an importance right now of actually having the U.S. title on Agreed. U.S. shows. They're just kind of seeing it as another yeah. one of their titles. So why not have – you have John Moxley. He's already said he's going to be doing more dates. We're seeing him here. He's on multiple matches throughout this tour. So obviously they're going to be planning on using Moxley a lot more this year. Right. So I can see him retain – even though he can't compete on U.S. shows, I can see him – retaining that U.S. title and having big U.S. title matches in Japan against some top guys in that Suzuki type of role, maybe even like a Sabre or some other guys that are not really in the mix right now. And in the IWGP heavyweight title picture, you have Moxley face off against those guys in U.S. title matches. I agree. You could hypothetically come to the U.S. and defend any title, whether it be the Never, whether it be the IWGP Intercontinental or even the junior title on a U.S. show if that's what your proclivity was, or as we've seen on this last tour, you don't necessarily even have to have the title headline. Um, so you're absolutely right. They could definitely do that. And if you want to continue to build John Moxley and, and continue the reign, you could do that. I just think it would make sense because Suzuki is a guy who's eligible to be the kind of caliber star to beat him. But if, if John Moxley beats him, I won't be surprised. And I, I agree with every point you made. Yeah. So Either, either way they go, it's going to be a, an interesting result. Kind of see the direction they go with the U.S. <laughs> title and the direction they go with both uh, Suzuki and Moxley. One last thing. I think the slotting of the, the show, Takahashi and uh, yeah, Hiromu and, and uh, Lee, they're going to kill it. They're going to, like, literally kill it. And I think very few guys could actually follow them and have a – that's almost a death spot to follow those two guys, similar to what we saw at Wrestle Kingdom after uh, – Takahashi and Osprey. It was very hard for Naito and and Jay White to kind of follow that action, but because of the kind of physical match Suzuki and Moxley are going to have, and the kind of star power that they bring to the match, I think that they're the perfect slotting to be yeah. semi just behind that match. Totally. So yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, it's going to be a completely different style of match. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. And let's talk about the main event. Uh, Tetsuya Naito defending. IWGP heavyweight and IWGP intercontinental heavyweight titles against Kenta. Right, and one note there, you know, a lot of people had questions on how are they treating these title defenses. So if you go on New Japan World, they are treating this as a defense for the heavyweight title and the intercontinental title, keeping both those lineages alive. So there's still technically two separate titles, even though you have a double champion. Like we mentioned earlier, Naito plans on defending those separately going forward if he retains here tonight. I think that um, for people who have concerns about this match, there are some people who are like, there are some fans who think that this match might not deliver. Go watch the interactions between Naito and Kenta from their Noah days in their tag team match. It's going to be freaking awesome. Dude, Naito is going to fall on his head a bunch of times. Kenta's gonna slap the crap out of him. Gonna kick the it's shit gonna be out a hard hitting, yeah. crazy. Like honestly, it might be like a similar layout to a Naito Abushi matches that we saw last year. Yeah, with the kind of like like hard hitting style that Kenta brings, um, there are probably few guys that are suited to take that punishment and get sympathy and be, you know, with. Naito's sort of attitude that he just doesn't care and that he dismisses guys and it infuriates them. Kent is the perfect guy because he's just such a dick and Naito just doesn't care. 
there's going to be a really fantastic dynamic dynamic between these two guys. And um, I think this match is going to rule. <sighs> honestly, I really yeah, do. Right. And I feel like we don't see a ton of cheating in Kento's matches. Yes, he has it. He has had some interference. Probably the biggest one would be the Royal Quest match where G.O.D. came out. But I feel like since then, a lot of his matches haven't had much cheating. I mean, he beat Ishii clean. What was that? Power Struggle um, for the Never title or uh, King of Pro Wrestling, one of those two yeah. shows. So we could get less shenanigans here and it could be a straight-up match. Well, it's a big title match in Osaka Joe Hall. I think it would be a misstep to have it laden with interference. Maybe there might be a rep bump. Maybe there might be some outside interference, but I think it's going to be kept at a minimum because it's a big show. Um, but ultimately, like, these guys have a really great dynamic between the two of them. They work together, so it's not like they're unfamiliar with one another. And, um, you know, for those people that wanted Naito to have a meaningful title run after winning both belts, this is a great guy to do it. You know, um, all criticism aside for the angle and how we got here, once we get to the match, the match is going to deliver. And I think Naito is one of the best guys that can... Um, let me put it to you this way. Many of Naito's best matches are against guys like Goto and Ishii and Shibata and Suzuki, guys that can really strike well and that he can like... And even Kota Ibushi, for that matter... Kenta's right in that wheelhouse, and Naito works so well with those so, so, sort of uh, opponents. I can't imagine that they're going to go out there and stink up the, you know, no. not at all. And I think there are some people who have been disappointed with some of Kenta's early uh, performances or even Naito's last year. But, like, coming off the, the match he just had with uh, Okada and the momentum he has, and Kenta kind of getting more acclimated to the house style in New Japan, I think that we're, this is the perfect time. To have this kind of match for these two guys. What do you think, Jamie? Yeah, I mean, Naito's been pretty banged up, you know, and it's always been it's been kind of tough to to watch. <laughs> uh, I mean, not tough to watch in in the sense that I'm not enjoying the matches, but tough to watch. Like, oh man, he's just not the same Naito from two years ago, that kind of thing. But I don't know, he's going to be super motivated, you know, especially because it's his first big title defense after that, you know, monumental Wrestle Kingdom. Um, I agree with you with him uh, really showing up against uh, opponents that are have a really hard hitting style. He's not, you know, if if it's more about taking strikes and, and striking battles and less about like, you know, having to take like big head bumps and things like that. I'm a little bit more into it. So I I just hope they don't like just destroy each other <laughs> to the point where I, I don't want to watch it anymore. <laughs> like I hope that's not the case, but I mean. I'm pretty hyped on that match. So I, I both got both guys are going to be insanely motivated for sure. Like so that's that's really all you need to know. Final thought and prediction: Naito retains. Absolutely. Yeah, I think Naito retains also because they've been dropping some hints that we're getting a Naito Tanahashi match down the line. Um, these guys have been facing off against each other. Um, you know, Lij and Tanahashi have been facing off during the Fantastic Mania tour. And then Naito has been saying in post-match promos that he remembers getting pinned by Tanahashi during the Fighting Spirit um, tour that happened in the Northeast last year. So I think maybe it might, maybe Dominion or uh, maybe Sakura Genesis, we're going to get Naito versus Tanahashi. All right, so that's going to do it for our review of New Beginning Tour for the U.S. as well as uh, Osaka and uh, as well as uh, Sapporo. Uh, we, we're going to get to fan questions here. We didn't open up the show for questions last week, and you guys hit us up, and so many people are like, where were the questions? Well, this week we've got them, and there's a ton of them. We're going to get to them, but when we do, we're going to, because we're running uh, late on time, we're going to keep it as short as possible on these questions because there are a ton to get through. One quick thing before we do that, though, uh, in the group chat, <laughs> we got a really funny comment from uh, from a fan, friend of the show, Dan uh, Coffin. He said, is Jamie on keeping a strong style tonight? Three J's. The real Super J cast. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the triple J crown. Yeah. Shout out to uh, Damon and Joel. <laughs> so let's uh, let's take some questions. Yep. So first question from a uh, friend of the show, Josh McLaughlin. He says, sorry if this was brought up on your review show, but how did you feel about Naito not being involved in the finish of the tag match at New Year's Dash a night after not getting his Wrestle Kingdom moment going off air? 
Um, I'll start. I think it's uh, pretty normal. I could understand why people would want to see him uh, finish strong on that night and, and get the singles win. But keep in mind, very often, your top stars, when they're in uh, tag matches, they don't always get wins. You won't see Okada, Tanahashi, Jay White, guys like that always pick up that pinfall. Many times, uh, especially if you're trying to build up uh, a teammate that they're with, they might be the one who who pick up the pinfall win there. Usually, if one of your top guys, like say Naito, does pick up a win, it's either because they're trying to heat him up and, and strengthen him, or there's a storytelling element to why they, they picked up that win. Very often, it's it's kind of more your mid-card guys, your lower guys, who are actually picking up uh, tag team pinfall wins. Right, and clearly the objective here, they wanted to get over the sonata J White rivalry and to build that matchup here. Obviously, with Naito being the champion, and obviously Kenta already kind of got his moment to challenge for the title at Wrestle Kingdom. They, they wanted to focus on kind of building up that uh, the sonata J White match. So our next question comes from Reddit user Grunty Dodds. He says, "I rewatched the Omega Jericho match." And for, had forgotten all about the spot where Jericho had Shoto Amino in the Lion Tamer while taking while talking shit to Red Shoes. What are the odds that they'll build on this once Shooter comes <coughs> back? Um, well, I think it all depends on whether or not uh, you know Jericho's even still around. When by the time Shooter comes back from Excursion, I mean I'm guessing he's going to be gone. You know, two to three years on Excursion, so. If Jericho's still going, I mean, I think that'd be a, a cool kind of story to kind of bring back. Yeah, if uh, if if Shota ever gets to a place where he's slotted to have a match with Jericho, which we'll see how how much how many more years Jericho has staying power with New Japan. But I mean, if they if that match does happen at some point, Jericho's definitely going to bring that back up. He doesn't forget that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if there's enough time for them to actually do something for a serious match between these two guys, but maybe maybe there might be some sort of element where uh, <laughs> where Jericho slaps him or, or something down the line. I don't know. Who, who knows? That would be a, a fun little thing. J- Jericho likes to do stuff like that, but I don't I don't see them having like a serious singles match down the line unless. Unless that forbidden door opens. You know, you know, <laughs> the forbidden and portal. Show, show that, yeah, Shota and uh, Moxley in AEW. Next question from uh, Just a Little Bear 01. He said, uh, with the Olympics pushing the G1 into the fall, what do you see uh, New Japan doing for shows during that period of time? For my money, I think it would be an opportunity to do a few-week tour in the USA. Yeah, I mean, they could definitely do a tour in the USA. Like we mentioned earlier, we've been hearing rumors about a big show and, you know, Sometime during August, we know that they've been looking at Madison Square Garden to run again. I know there's been some complications with that building, but they are planning on doing some kind of big U.S. building this year. So definitely they could do a tour that kind of leads up to that big show that they end up doing in August. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, um, I don't have all the details in front of me, but there was speculation from a lot of fans who were like, well, you know what? They're... The Olympics actually don't interfere very much with a lot of the uh, types of um, arenas that New Japan does like to run during that time of the year uh, for the G1. And so there was speculation from some fans who were like, maybe they're not moving the G1 at all because really it was only like a couple dates that conflicted, not really the whole tour. So I wouldn't be surprised if they do end up doing Japanese dates as well as U.S. dates during that time because I don't think it's... I think really more the concern is what is the interest level going to be during that time when all of Japan's attention is on the Olympics, not so much the venues themselves. Right, yeah, I don't think the venues are a deal. I think it's more just like drawing. Like, are all the people going to be going to the Olympics? And is that going to hurt the attendance numbers for Japanese houses? I, I think people in Japan, uh, they know where the real king of sport is. <laughs> <laughs> they know where the real Olympics are. <laughs> uh, next question from Reddit user Chuck Kidman. He says, with the addition of the LA Dojo guys and the New Japan Dojo guys, it seems the roster in a few years is going to be pretty crowded and tough for younger guys to push up, especially for future graduates of the dojo after the current crop we see now? You bring up a good point, but keep in mind that there's definitely an attrition uh, when it comes to uh, young lions. We've been fortunate enough in the past few years to see certain graduating classes uh, have a high level of graduates make it, but there are entire lost classes that never made it uh, to the main level 
or, you know, had various different things happen to them. Even this, we saw a class recently where there was like four, four or five guys that we thought were going to be something and like a lot of them are gone. So I think it's good uh, for New Japan, especially with them trying to expand the amount of shows they're doing in, in various different countries to expand their dojo system. And if anything that we know about the way they book and, and develop stars, they always find a way to slot these guys and, and create room for them. So I can see where what you're talking about. There could be a log jam, but I think there's creative and smart ways to where they can incorporate these guys without it being too too problematic. Wasn't Sonata like kicked out of the dojo early in his career? He, I don't think he was kicked out. He like didn't make it. He didn't make it. He he was one of the uh, guys that uh, what's it called where you try out? Oh, just yeah. Yeah, he tried out for for the dojo because they only take so many. Right. He, he applied. Like, yeah. He applied. Yeah, he yeah. was an applicant and he didn't make it, uh, and he ended up uh, training elsewhere. Uh, next question from Reddit user: <coughs> Why did you do that, bro? He said early G one pick. Oh, he actually had more to that question. Oh, skipped over that. So he said, like when guys such as Okada, who are going to be in their mid-30s, Jay White and Osprey will be pushing 30 as the top stars in the company, and guys like Goto and Ishii are going to most likely uh, be headed towards scaling back or retirement. So my question is, how do you think New Japan will handle the dojo talent finding a place when the time comes? And I think I kind of answered yeah, you, that. Yeah, you kind of answered that, yeah. Yeah, so uh, why did you do that, bro? Asked early G1 pick. Uh, I'm saying Will Ospreay. I'm pick, yeah, I'm picking Will Ospreay, too. I think Ospreay makes a lot of sense. I think you could go that way, but I'm going to throw a curveball out there. I'm going to say Shingo Takagi. Mm, that's a great choice. Uh, next question from Reddit user Sizable Burger Bun. When does Okada win the big one back? I think I miss him already. I would say this. I wouldn't be surprised if he regains it this year, but I would prefer that they keep him out of the title picture until next year. I think that's more interesting at this point. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of keep him out of the picture that long. Uh, but, I mean, he's, he's another guy that could potentially win the G1 also. Here's, Yeah, he could win the G1, and that, that would be a pretty popular pick. I say maybe... Maybe after New Japan Cup next year, Sakura Genesis, he wins it back. Or actually, you know what? How about this? New beginning. He's going to win it one year from now. New beginning after the Dome. He'll have a fantastic Dome showing, and then he'll be the number one contender. He'll regain the title from whoever holds it at that point. I think he's going to probably win it at the Dome. I, th I think he'll be in the main event of whatever the title match is going to be. And well, then he needs to win the G1. Yeah, I guess so. Unless they do some kind of double gold dash again <laughs> so yeah we'll see what happens uh next question from reddit user psan91 with the new beginning in osaka car looking like another dominion level show do you think this will be the norm going forward or is it just because it's the first year in osaka joe hall and they need big time matches to sell tickets yeah i i don't know if it'll be the norm going forward i think it depends on how they draw to this show and the availability of of that venue going forward um but if it does well, then maybe. But yeah, I think it, they're doing it because they, they need big time matches. And they need to sell tickets. Right. Yeah. You know, obviously, if they don't sell out or come close to their normal Dominion numbers for this new beginning in Osaka, they could definitely see them scaling back to a smaller arena for that new beginning tour next year. But if they do well, then I definitely see them continuing to run Osaka Joe Hall more times throughout the year. Yeah. It seems like they're testing the waters, especially com coming out of. Um you know this, the you know the two the two big nights at, at Wrestle Kingdom. They have enough. They had enough, um, I guess, juice coming out of the, those matches uh, that they could run another big show that that early. So if you're if you have to shuffle some things around um, and you're not able to run the shows in you know mid mid year, doing the stacking the, the the early in the year makes a lot of sense. So. Hey, I'm all for it. There was a time where they used to do big shows every other month and they were like dominion level. And then over the past few years, we've seen that really diluted with them doing multiple nights, you know, kind of spread out and doing like sea level shows. And so if they're going to start doing bigger venues with bigger cards throughout the year, not just dominion, not just wrestle kingdom, I'm all for that. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. So more big matches. 
Yeah, not much yeah. to complain about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next question comes from Highest Fly Flow. Great, great name. What do you guys think of Taguchi's mullet from Fantastic Mania? <laughs> I haven't seen that. I have. So honestly, like I saw the match, I but I didn't. I didn't notice it. Oh, I noticed it immediately. <laughs> so that's something we don't talk about enough on this show is the various hairstylings of one uh, Ryosuke Taguchi. This is a man who sometimes will come in looking super dapper with a great hairstyle, and then come in with a, some fuck shit. Like, <laughs> like he'll buzz his hair, or other times he'll shave it on the sides, like he does now, and have this weird looking mullet. Uh, I, I kind of like the mullet, I guess, for his character, but it doesn't scream like. Um, you know, best super juniors semifinalist to me right now, but you know, it's Taguchi, so Taguchi will Taguchi. <laughs> uh, he also asked this question and uh, added on said, Also, seen the idea floating around of Sonata winning the New Japan Cup and being the one to dethrone Naito, this creates a rift in LIJ, contrary to Jeremy's evil turning on LIJ prediction and saving the IWGP title match between Okada and Sonata for a bigger stage and create more uncertainty. What do you guys think of this? I'll say I like that booking. Yeah, I can definitely kind of see that going forward. And like we mentioned, they're elevating Sonata. You know, Sonata beats Jay White and then goes into that New Japan Cup with that momentum. Then you tell this great story of Sonata kind of dethroning and, you know, beating his LIJ leader. There's a lot of stories you can have there. You can have Sonata turn. You can have Nigel turn on Sonata. There's a lot of different ways you can go with that story. I think ultimately it's very combust combustible at this point with – the amount of stars that they have in LIJ, I know that there's people who are like, well, they, they're not going to get rid of LIJ because of how much merch they do. And that does ring true, but someone's got to break out of that group eventually. Yeah, whether, Sonata would be my pick for sure. And we were very hesitant about Sonata being the one guy who didn't win gold and who also uh, was teaming with um, Naito at New Year's Dash with being the one guy who didn't win gold. And keep in mind, if if Naito does win both belts in, in his retention, and then they do the golden roll call, and everyone walks out with all their gold, and Sonata's the one guy without the belts, I think some of that is going to ring true come the end of New Beginning. So I think that that's a, a good booking um, decision. Plus, keep in mind that over the past two or three years, Sonata has continuously gotten closer and closer to winning the New Japan Cup. And he was, you know, semifinals and then the finals. And then if he does win it, he's absolutely right. I think that that's great booking right there. And I think that's a good way to maybe even hypothetically get the belt off Naito in a believable way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So next question from Reddit user Pizza Roll Fire. How do you see Jay White getting away from the constant scrub finishes? I feel as, I feel as if I don't even feel like watching his matches anymore, knowing there will be Gato there as a crutch. Yeah, I think that this has been a, a complaint throughout the years. Going, I mean, you can go back to like the Makai Club, then the Bullet Club, Suzuki Goon matches. I mean, there was a time where people hated watching Minoru Suzuki matches because of the constant in interference from uh, from Suzuki. I mean, or from you know Suzuki Goon. Just look at like his run in Noah. Uh, that really didn't get curbed until they came back from their exodus. So I mean. This is something we see throughout the years that New Japan always kind of has this element with some characters, whether it be Jay White or someone else. It's probably always going to be the case, especially with Gato being such a Southern style mark. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I mean, Jay White, I, I don't know when he's going to get away from, from that, but I got to imagine at some point they're going to let him be his own man and kind of get away from this. I don't I don't see it happening in the near future, but Right. I don't think he's gonna get away from it until he turns baby face. As long as he's a heel, as long as he's in Bullet Club, we're still gonna get that the cheating and the shenanigans and the, the Gato interferences. I don't I don't think until he fully turns leaves Bullet Club and becomes a full on baby face where we'll see totally kind of straight up JY matches. I could see it once they book him stronger. Cause up to this point they have made him like the ultimate like opportunist and a counter wrestler who can catch you at any moment. But if they really decide at some point to even elevate him further and be someone who can win matches on his own without the interference, he could still stay heel and, and do those things, but they need somebody else to kind of fit that role to be the, the rule breaker who has the outside interference and not just him. I think it's, I think that they'll do this once because they can't have every act in the company do that. So if they introduce someone else who's doing that, maybe they'll scale back on Jay White doing it. Yeah. 
Uh, next question from Reddit user WizFactor. Would appreciate if you can dedicate a few minutes to Jericho's post-match promo regarding AEW and New Japan. He kind of broke kayfabe during the interview, which suggests the stakes between the two promotions were too high not to make a shoot statement. What do you think? I think it makes all the sense in the world for a guy like Chris Jericho to want this to happen, given the fact that he's employed by both companies. And so it's very self-serving to a certain degree. Not to say that it wouldn't benefit, hypothetically, both companies or even the the workers in both uh, groups, but I'll just say this. Could there be some sort of working relationship down the road? Maybe, but a lot of political things would need to change. A lot of business things would need to change. I think if New Japan and USA is a complete flop and isn't going to happen and they're not going to be getting U.S. TV date or TV time, you know, a deal then maybe that could be a more realistic opportunity. But with them being direct competitors, I don't know how that benefits them. Like, yes, they could do really big business from a um, standpoint of, like, could they draw crowds to watch their shows? Absolutely. But when it comes to, like, TV rights deals and streaming and, you know, contracts and also the booking Who's gonna Who's gonna be in control of the booking and go over stronger? Those are all, those are all hurdles that they're not gonna be able to get over. Plus, the bad feelings on both sides when it comes to the elite and and New Japan. I don't see this happening, and I've said that from the get go. I don't see this happening. Like, if you want my honest opinion, like ever. In fact, I know this sounds crazy, but I I would like think it would be easier for like New Japan to find. Here's how unrealistic I think it is. I think New Japan would work with WWE before they'd work with AEW. Wow. Interesting. I don't, I don't take know if I'd say that. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know if it's likely to happen. I think all the, you know, all the guys who have the, the, the license to, to work in New Japan kind of already have that contract written up. Right. You can get, you know, if, they, if, if Kenny really wanted to go over there and New Japan had a spot for him, he can do it. Um, Jericho's doing it. Moxley's doing it. Like, you kind of have all the guys you want to see. Like, I mean, I guess not Cody and the Bucks, but, like, I don't know. I'm, I kind of had my fill with them with New Japan for a while. I'm ready to take a break with those guys. I just I don't really need to see an MJF over in New Japan. I don't need to see, you know, like, I don't know. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I, I think that there could be some real benefits. There's a lot of talking points and ways that it could benefit. If we were talking about business models that were similar to the relationship Ring of Honor had with New Japan years ago, but the wrestling landscape has changed so drastically and so vastly in the past year, and it's continuing to change that, like, there are literal walls that prevent these groups from working with one another. If they did, it would have to be on a very minimal basis, maybe a talent exchange at the most but not like super shows and not like running tours together. I just can't see that happening. Right. And like you were mentioning, you know, Jericho kind of speaking up on this, obviously like a a better partnership would benefit him mostly because he's already worked for both companies. And the more that they work together, that would be more exposure for him, more money for him, uh, you know, more dates for him on both companies. So I think definitely the comments he had, had after the press conference were more like, to benefit, like, yes, like you said, it could benefit both companies, but I think essentially Jericho's kind of looking out for how this benefit Jericho. We don't live in the era any longer where New Japan is relegated to strictly being a Japanese product on the other side of the world, where you can send the Steiner brothers to win the IWGP tag titles or have Sting work a dome show. It, it's not that anymore, you know, sending guys an excursion to work in, in the NWA, like, that That was a total, that was semi-regional if you think about it in those senses the u.s was the u.s japan was japan but it's not like that anymore these companies are international and they're aiming for the same audiences and they are direct competitors that makes it very hard for them to work together honestly they have similar goals and it's business and it's competition they're competition for each other yeah. And why would you go on excursion to a company that doesn't even run house shows? Like, you're not getting any, any real work in, you know? Yep. Yep. And and I think that that's one of the benefits people see. They're like, well, if, if New Japan and USA is running shows, then maybe, like, they could send over, you know, some like some of their 
greener talent that needs you know exposure and that that would make sense if they weren't both trying to get tv deals and both you know trying yeah. to stream and everything like that like it there's just too there's too many complications there honestly yeah so next question from reddit, reddit user viking pain he says with marty scroll and bandito Resigning with Ring of Honor and the additions of Roosh, Dragon Lee, Flamita, and Ray Horace to the ROH roster, do you see the partnership with ROH and New Japan becoming stronger? Those are definitely talents that I think New Japan would be interested in using. Marty, obviously his history with New Japan, obviously Dragon Lee being signed to both companies, and then, you know, Roosh, Flamita, and Ray Horace, those these are all guys that New Japan would like to work with so yeah i think it actually could hypothetically uh make the partnership stronger but i also think that roh and new japan face some of the same dilemmas that um new japan and aew have with one another the difference being that ring of honor and new japan have worked together for so long and ring of honor truth be told doesn't have any plans to truly expand beyond what they've been in the past right and New Japan has all the leverage when it comes to that relationship and has exploited it, to be quite frank. And so, yeah, it could make it stronger because there are some things New Japan might benefit from. But it would take Ring of Honor sort of getting themselves out of the rut that they're in to actually benefit both companies. Which could be happening based off some changes that happened over the weekend. Uh, We'll see. (laughs) And uh, also, Viking Paint asks, also, do you guys believe the Meltzer story about if Omega had stayed in New Japan, he could be the one to face Naito at Wrestle Kingdom 14 in the main event for the double titles and not Okada? Me, personally, I think he's full of crap. So, just to kind of reiterate, what the story was, was that Omega was going to basically have the similar booking to uh, Jay White through the first quarter of the year and ultimately go into the Dome with the title taking on uh, Okada. And then the story that Dave Meltzer said was that he was actually going to retain the title against Okada at Madison Square Garden. Throughout the year, basically, uh, Okada would win the IC title, and then we'd get the same double dash gold rush that we ended up getting this past year, but it would be Ibushi versus Omega on night one for the IWGP title, and then night two, Naito (laughs) versus Okada for the IC title leading to a title match between, um, you know, Naito probably facing Kenny Omega, I would assume, and winning both belts. I got to tell you, I don't think that's true. I For a couple reasons. Number one, I don't see them having Okada lose at Madison Square Garden no matter who it was against. I think that he was always going to win in Madison Square Garden, period. I do think that it, it is believable that it could have been those four guys in the double gold dash, but from a storyline perspective, the, the match they protected for the last two years and the match they built to for six years was always going to be Okada and Naito for both belts from a storyline perspective. So, no, I don't see... And now I do believe that they could have done Naito and... I'm sorry, uh, Omega and Ibushi in the Dome. That's something that we've heard talk about. And, you know, uh, Omega's talked about that openly, like that he lobbied for that match for a long time. But if they were, I think it would have been for the IC title. Yeah, I think it would have made uh, a lot more sense you do. Actually, some of it still doesn't really make sense if you think about it. I still think ultimately it's going to be Okada and Naito for both belts. So Right, yeah, I think what would have happened if Omega was there in the dash, you would do Omega, you would do... You do Omega Okada night one, and you would do Naito Ibushi night one, and have Naito win, have Okada win, and then not then you do Naito Okada for night two, and then you do Omega Ibushi on night two as well. Yeah, some of this just doesn't ring true to me, to be honest with you. Like, it, I, I hate to say it, but it sounds like Kenny Omega, who's good friends with Dave Meltzer, told him his version of how he thinks things would have gone or what whatever, and. Dave Meltzer just spewing it out with without maybe even checking with like I'm sure he didn't talk to Gato about this I'm sure he didn't talk to like right the booking. <laughs> he's just it's second hand like it just doesn't sound real yeah I, I it always seemed like the, the um like the the Ibushi Omega 
dome match thing was kind of something they've always were lobbying for that New Japan never really seemed super into. I mean, they, they didn't even want to have their G1 match, right? Didn't they want to be separated? Yeah. And they were just like, nah, you got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, they were like, we need it because it it's the Budokan. Yeah. Right. And it did fantastic business. R- right. So, like, I don't know. I, I That would... I'm kind of with you there. I'm not sure if I totally believe. Maybe there's something to it, but who knows? I I, I think it always was leading to Okada Naito rematch. This would so. this would also assume that they didn't elevate Jay White to the level they did this year, which also I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it it doesn't sound like it was impossible what he said that scenario, but I don't think it would have played out the way that they're saying it did. Yeah, I, and plus, I mean, we heard stories early in the year that the plans were. Pro Omega to lose at Madison Square Garden that he had Omega was telling Dave, you know, oh yeah, Jay took my booking for the beginning of the year. Yep. So what happened to that story? <laughs> Next question. Rambo and Slam Pig asks, with Kawato San recently losing a Lucha de Apuestas match and having already held gold in CMLL, do you think his excursion is coming to an end soon? If so, where do you think he fits on the roster? Uh, I do want to say, I think it's interesting. I expected Kawato to be on this Fantastic Mania tour, similar to when Hiromu returned as Kamatachi on the tour back in like 2016, and that didn't happen. Kawato's not on this tour, so I think that's kind of weird. But um, yeah, I think that him holding gold and losing uh, you know, a hair versus, I don't know if it was hair versus hair or hair versus mask match, those are two big signs that he might hypothetically be close to coming back from his excursion. He's been gone almost, what, two years now? Yeah, it's been a hot minute. So, yeah, uh, as far as where he fits on the roster, that's up to them. I, I don't know, really. Uh, I mean, what are your guys' thoughts? Yeah, I, I feel like, obviously, there's the whole LIJ connection with him doing the excursion in CMLL, Especially if some LIJ members are going to be leaving, like you know, we, we, there's a lot of talk of Sonata and Evil kind of breaking off this year, so you could kind of pull Kawato into the fold there. That's always been something that um, they alluded to, like when he was a young lion, uh, Naito always kind of treated him differently and almost so, sort of like had an eye on him as a potential member down the line, or at least that's what speculation was. So with him going to Mexico, coming back, there's that Mexican connection with. Uh, Lij, that's definitely a possibility, and I think that that would make sense. But at the same time, they've got two juniors already, and he's probably coming back as a junior. Right. So, but hey, I don't know where else. Maybe he just kind of stays like part of the home team. He's because kind of like they build him as like a new, almost in a Kashida role, where he's like the new Japan like junior. Now, keep in mind when uh, Hiromu lost his hair, they waited till he grew his hair back out to bring him back. So I don't know. They might wait for him to uh, <laughs> to, to get that look back, but uh, we'll see. Um, he also said, is it just me or is the Hoss off slash strong style never division looking a little reinvigorated after Wrestle Kingdom and Dash? I'm picturing Shingo, Evil, Ishii, Goto, and Hanari all being active this year. What's not to love? Yeah, never division looks just amazing right now with those guys kind of being the ones that are going to be the the focus of the division. And I think we're going to get a lot of great matches between all five of these guys, and even you could throw Suzuki in the mix there. You can throw John Moxley in the mix, Zack Sabre Jr. Kenta's uh, still around. Yeah, yeah, you could throw Kenta in the mix. Um, there's a lot of guys that, along with these five guys, that you kind of mix and match these guys. We're going to get a lot of great never matches, a lot of great candidates for our strong style match of the year. And then um, the final question, and it's a long one. Um <laughs> From Dom Homie 101, uh, multiple part question, multi, multi. (laughs) He said, uh, um, with the career of Jushin Thunder Liger being over, where does he rank among the all-time greats? What will be his legacy? Will there ever be another junior heavyweight that could could uh, come close to being on the same level as Liger? Well, uh, I think he definitely ranks as one of the greatest junior heavyweights of all time. I mean, this is a guy we've talked about this on the show before that he just kind of, you know, competed across multiple decades and just had amazing matches within all those dec- decades and a guy that's just worked all over the world, yeah. U.S., U.K., Australia, Mexico. He's been all over the place. Canada. Canada. His footprint is literally all over the wrestling world. You watch a lot of guys that, 
came up in the 90s. A lot of guys kind of emulate Liger and uh, utilize a lot of his moves in their style today still. He's a guy that's been the dojo, and he's had his hands on training some of the guys coming out of the New Japan dojo. So his his legacy is going to be just how great he was in and out of the ring all across the business. Yeah, when you talk about Liger and where he ranks among the all-time greats, you're talking about a top 50 all-time great wrestler, and you could put him pretty high uh, amongst the heap of, of wrestlers. He's undoubtedly the greatest junior heavyweight wrestler that has ever lived, and that's even, I'm ranking him above Rey Mysterio Jr. when I say that. That's lofty. And I mean, it, 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 it plays on so many things. The fact that he elevated so many other junior heavyweights, the fact that he gave so many other junior heavyweights their best matches of their entire career, the fact that he got over everywhere he wrestled, whether it was in the States, in WCW, Ring of Honor, TNA, uh, his stuff in Stampede, his stuff in, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, what's that wrestling that I like over in Britain? Um, world Sport? Yeah, his World of Sports stuff. Um, not only that, but like, the gimmick that he worked and the way that he was able to kind of make that such an iconic image. Um, as I mentioned, him booking the junior division all throughout the 90s and elevating other promotions and other performers from outside, giving guys opportunities. Super J Cup. Yeah, his inventions like the Super J Cup and the J Crown and everything of that nature. And also... Being, Shooting Star Press. Yeah, his, <laughs> his invention of, of, of that, the moments that he gave us. And then also... His longevity, being such a great wrestler, he didn't just, you know, for instance, Big Show just wrestled in four different decades, but people are not going to be talking about Big Show <laughs> the same way that they're talking about Juice and Thunder Liger. I mean, he was great in the 80s. He was great in the 90s. He was great in the 2000s. He was great in the 2010s. And then even in this decade, in the 2020 era, he was still great. And so he's going out still being able to go as a, as a top performer. Um yeah, I think there are guys who are going to be able to rival him when it comes to athleticism and things of that nature. I mean, just look at Will Ospreay. But when you talk about the him as a whole, everything that he has uh, given to the wrestling industry, it is going to be very hard for anybody to kind of uh, match the accolades and the contributions that he's made to wrestling. Right. They really need that longevity. That's going to be the key. Like, can some junior heavyweight – Go for multiple decades and also have the kind of impact that he had across the world. Jamie? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with what you said there. But, uh, and uh, I would say that, you know, when you think about, when I think about, you know, the, the 90s New Japan, like I don't think of the, the, the three musketeers, I don't think of Chono, I think of Liger in the juniors division. Like that was. That was the reason why I even, like, would watch any of that stuff. I was just like, that's, you know, growing up, that's what I thought wrestling in Japan was, was literally just Liger in the juniors division. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't get turned on to, like, the All Japan stuff and, and the Three Musketeers stuff and anything else till much later. It was the WCW juniors division and, oh, this is what wrestling in Japan is. And it was dope. It was awesome. So... Yeah, Liger had a huge impact on You me. look at the long list of guys that he was able to elevate. and I mean, Takaiwa and Otani and Owen Hart and Brian Pillman and Sasuke and Delphin and yeah. Kushida. And, I mean, you could go on and on and on. There's so many guys. So, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's, it's difficult to kind of encapsulate exactly what made Liger so great. Yeah. Um, Next question, he said, this is a question for the young boy. If you guys want to chime in, you can. It's a, it's a tough one. What are some of Nakanishi's must-see matches to watch? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I pulled up a couple of recommended matches. Uh, I think probably the best match of his career, well, the two best ones, probably the uh, June 14th, 1995 match from Budokan Hall, him versus Shinya Hashimoto. That's probably widely considered his highest-rated match. Uh, another one that's <laughs> definitely worth checking out is him versus the Great Muda from the G1 Climax in 1999. That, I believe that was the finals. Uh, that was like one of his big, like, you know, coming out uh, matches. Uh, him and Satoshi Kojima in the finals of the Young Lion Cup in I the mid 90s. I can't remember the exact year, but you can definitely find it. Um, one that's really recent that st uh, sticks out in my mind. He had a match with um, 
Yuji Nagata um, from uh, Cork and Hall Road to Tokyo Dome, December 17th, 2016, which was a surprisingly good match. Uh, probably one of the last good, like, late career matches he had. And then uh, the last one is, uh, I don't have the exact date, but the match between him and Hiroshi Tanahashi, um, when he defeated Hiroshi Tanahashi for the IWGP title in uh, Cork and Hall, the only time that that title ever changed hands in Cork and Hall, uh, it's the career-defining moment of uh, Nakanishi and is a really, really underrated match. Uh, so those would be the ones that I would like point to and, and kind of you know make mention of. Um, next question from uh, Dom Homie 101. Uh, thoughts on Okada and Moxley teaming up? Does it make Okada an honorable shield member or does it make Moxley an honorable chaos member, LOL? Well, since the, the shield is no more and chaos is going strong, I think it would make him an honorable chaos member, right? I like the idea of Okada being an honorable uh, teammate with him alongside Kurt Angle, the new shield. <laughs> and Triple H. And Triple H. And tri- <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, that was the era when they're just throwing vests on dudes. They're in the shield. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, yeah, I think I think it's interesting. I think Okada and Moxley are not going to play well together, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think it's definitely setting up a big match down the line. Uh, thoughts on the possibility of Jericho in this year's G1 Climax? Never going to happen. Bro, Jericho is... He's he's still great, but he's just not at the level to compete in the G1 anymore. Think about the weeks and on that, that how long and like this grueling that tour is. Like that would tear him up. <laughs> <laughs> I think he could do it, but he won't do it because keep in mind he's on a deal where he's getting paid huge money to wrestle only in big matches on big cards a few times a year for for New Japan. Uh, do I think he could do it, sort of like a Tanahashi run? Like, yeah, he could do it, but then keep in mind all of his TV obligations in the States with AEW and the sweet deal that he has with New Japan. There's no way he's going to be in the G1. It makes Yeah, it makes no sense for like, him to do it. Yeah, they, they would have to pay him a lot of money. Jericho would have to be a mark for being like, you know, the one thing I've never done in my career yet is a G1 Climax. I want to really do that. Like, Jericho's not a mark for himself like that. Like, he's like, nah, I'll wrestle at Dominion. Just pay me. Pay me then. <laughs> yeah, I also think Jericho's nothing to prove doing that at his age. Like, there's no, no. I don't. I don't see. That. Next question from Dom Homie. Uh, more likely to be first Japanese IWGP US champion, Okada or Suzuki? Uh, I would say Suzuki, just because I don't think I really have a hard time seeing Okada win any other titles outside of the IWGP Heavyweight Title. I think the IC title might be the one other title he w- might win just based off the story Josh was telling earlier about him underestimating the title. But besides that, I think he's going to be one of those guys that he's mainly defined by the heavyweight title, and I really can't see him winning the U.S. title. I want to see Okada drop weight and enter the junior division. <laughs> <laughs> that weight cut. Uh, put that uh, that Tangaloa wants to do. No, I think Suzuki makes more sense. Uh, I Yeah, Okada's not going for any... Minor championships other than the IC title, if any at all. <laughs> I, I could see Okada ta- challenging for the U.S. title just like as a one-time. It depends on the matchup, just as like a one-time thing. But I don't think he wins, and I don't think it's a long-term thing. It would just be like, like if you're trying to build for like a like a U.S. big show, like like in around August or something. I could see like, oh, we're gonna have Okada challenging for the U.S. belt in in the U.S. like. I could see that happening, but I don't think he win. Um, next question from Dom Homie. More likely Wrestle Kingdom 15 match, Evil versus Naito or Kenta versus Jay White? I think Evil versus Naito. Um, I, I feel like Kenta and Jay White, I feel like Kenta, is a, he fits perfectly in that Bullet Club role. I don't see Kenta or Jay White leaving Bullet Club anytime soon. I think there's much more potential for Evil to break off from LIJ than Kenta or Jay White leave Bullet Club, so I think Evil and Naito would be a bigger shot than Kenta and Jay White. I think Evil Naito makes sense more so than Kenta versus Jay White with th- this one caveat. If Kenta were to win the IWGP title, there would be big problems in Bullet Club. Jay White is not going to have that. Uh, and then last question from Dom Homie 101. <laughs> with rumors of MLW teasing a major game-changing announcement, 
thoughts on a possible MLW New Japan alliance? Which I thought about this the other day, but uh, Jeremy, are they are they aligned with Triple A? So yeah, so MLW no, they're no, they're aligned with the Crash. With Crash, okay. But they're also aligned with Noah. Mm. Because so they sent uh, Hammerstone over to the to their uh, was the N one their their version of the G one yeah and yeah they've been sending guys over they've had guys from Noah come over to MLW so I think Noah is going to be their their long term major Japanese partner unless somehow that deal soured quickly and Court Bauer was able to finesse the deal with New Japan but I highly doubt that happens with such a short time period especially knowing how New Japan. Likes to kind of establish their their relationships with partners, so yeah, I don't think the big news for MLW is um, a New Japan partnership. Keep in mind a couple things: MLW was, uh, you know, breaming with top talent a year or two ago when they first started, but with the changing landscape in wrestling, that has really subsided. And yes, they have some talent, but not top stars. They just really don't. They're also not really a touring company. They're more of a television company at this point. Like, they do a lot of dates, but it's mostly for their television deals. Right. So that that's one thing to, like, kind of keep in consideration. And then I think, some again, a lot of the things we talk about with ROH and AW become issues with MLW. MLW is kind of like the, the, the ones who are playing nice with a lot of the other companies and being open as far as their contracts are concerned. But uh, I don't know how that would benefit New Japan necessarily. And, um, yeah, I don't know if it makes business sense right. realistically. I think it only benefits MLW. It would, yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much... And then, yeah, that's pretty much my thoughts on it. <laughs> cool. There's nothing really to add there. <laughs> I agree. And then um, this past week, Fantastic Mania had their first uh, night uh, on New Japan World. January 10th, uh, we saw uh, Fuego and Taguchi defeat uh, Kanemaru and Doki. Um, Euphoria, Lucifer, uh, Luciferno, and Nama Yagi defeated Aodaz, Guerrero Maya Jr., and Yuya Yumura. Soberano Jr. and Flyer defeated Negro Casa and Tiger. Glad to see Negro Casa on the uh, <laughs> on this uh, tour. Angel de Oro and Niebla Roja and Teton defeated Sansan, Quatrero, and Forestero. Uh, Tetsuya Naito, Hiromu Takahashi, and Bushi defeated Dolce Gardenia, Hir- Hiroshi Tanahashi, and Yotasuji. And in the main event, uh, Okamura, Barbaro Cavernario, and Ultimo uh, Guerrero uh, defeated the team of Satoshi Kojima, Stuka Jr., and Karistico uh, in a really fantastic main event that I enjoyed quite a bit. This is a fun, about two-hour show. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I would definitely say check it out. Yeah, so we're, we're not going to give you guys like the match, my batch, like the hole-by-hole breakdown here, but... Overall, I thought this first night of Fantastic Mania was a really fun show. Like I mentioned earlier, they are kind of planting some seeds between Naito and Tanahashi there in that, that multi-man match there. Uh, we had the, the anniversary match here for Okamura yeah. in, in the main event. And they're building for um, Cavanario facing off against Karistico and then Satoshi Kojima facing off against Ultimo Guerrero on the final night. So this week there are... Uh, Four shows coming up. They're all in Corkin Hall. They're doing the traditional, uh, the family brother tag team tournament that they always do on Fantastica Mania. And then they're doing the, that big singles match, Ultimo Guerrero versus Satoshi Gozima for the uh, CMLL heavyweight title. And then for the uh, historic, the NWA historic title, I believe it is, uh, Caristico versus Cavanario. Yeah, and for those of you who are listening, you probably are used to us traditionally giving you a really lengthy breakdown of the Fantastic Mania cards preview. Obviously, given how much content there was this past week, it was kind of impossible to do that. But we will be coming back next week with our review of Fantastic Mania, and we'll probably be giving you a lot of that insight and breakdown that you're used to. One thing I will say, don't sleep on Fantastica Mania. Last year, a lot of people, I feel like, didn't watch it, and man... It was a really, really great tour. Specifically, the matches between Cavernario and Soberano Jr. blow away, and so was the Caristico and Volador Jr. match, as well as many of those uh, tag team tournament matches. Like, I really love Fantastica Mania, and I'm really looking forward to, like, the Kojima and Guerrero match, I think is going to be a sleeper. I think that's actually going to be a banger. And then Cavernario, who is my favorite luchador, uh, taking on Caristico, that... That's going to be the main event of the entire tour. That's going to really deliver. So 
lot of really awesome talent here. If you're not familiar with a lot of these CMLL luchadors, uh, do yourself a favor and watch this stuff because it's completely different from what you usually see at New, in New Japan, but it is just an awesome like previewing of what Lucha, Lucha Libre basically is. Right, a great way to get you exposed to some of the top guys over in uh, CMLL. And then uh, let's finish it up with the news. Yeah, so we're going to run through these news items real quick. So uh, announced today, Switchblade Jay White is signed for Ring of Honor Supercard of Honor. You guys going to that? Uh, I got I got my takeover tickets already, so, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, will not will not be there. I tell you what, if they start announcing major like New Japan stars other than Jay White, I'm gonna be pissed because I'm going to take over as well. And if I find out like Abushi and yeah. Okada and all them are gonna be there, I'm gonna be like, fuck. <laughs> uh, and they all get singles match. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'm wondering who I would even want from Ring of Honor to see them wrestle, like other than Marty Skrull, Matt Taven, <laughs> Vinny. <laughs> uh, so uh, inbound ticket sales For the anniversary show on March 3rd They're on sale right now So if you're planning on heading to Japan For the anniversary show You can get those tickets uh, Tiger Hattori is going to be making an appearance During the new beginning in Tampa tour Minobu Nakanishi He's going to be retiring on February 22nd Calling the end to his 27 plus year career In a special uh, Corkin Hall event The free match of the week is from Fantastica Mania 2017, Teton versus Hiromu Takahashi. In other retirement news, we had Naoki Sano, who retired um, kind of quietly after the tag match between him and Liger versus Hiromu and Ryu Lee. NK, NHK, one of Japan's major networks, will be doing a one-hour special on Harold May in February. Uh, May is also slated to receive the Keizai Kai Global Businessman of the Year Award this month. It'll be the first time that the award has gone to someone who wasn't Japanese. Uh, also, more news on Nakanishi. He noted that uh, since suffering his major neck injury in 2012, he wasn't able to wrestle at the level he was before. So that's kind of what's leading to the retirement there. Uh, news on Jeff Cobb. He has not signed a new uh, deal with Ring of Honor. He was offered a new deal but turned it down um, he has a lot of interest from AEW right now, but he's planning on staying independent and he's going to keep working in Ring of Honor per date basis, not under contract. And then he's going to be uh, doing a lot more New Japan of America shows. Also signing um, with Ring of Honor is Dragon Lee. He's signed as far as like his American contract and also to kind of go hand in hand with his Japanese deal with New Japan. Um, and kind of some sad news. Uh, the brother and family of Robbie Eagles lost their homes in the horrible bushfires in Australia. There is a GoFundMe uh, pinned in the New Japan Reddit. So if you have the financial means to kind of donate to that cause and help out the Eagles family, that would be great. Absolutely. And then the final items here, uh, Marty Skrull re-signs with Ring of Honor and he joins the booking team with Delirious. No, he's the head booker now. He, uh, he's not the head booker. I saw it. <laughs> he's the head booker. And he's going to book himself <laughs> to win the the ROH world title that he so rightly deserves. He's, uh, the, he's the link between AEW and MLW and New Japan and well, CMLL. Well, there, are, there are reports <laughs> that one of Marty's goals on the booking team is to open up the doors with AEW, also to strengthen the relationship with New Japan. So... Apparently, Marty's going to be the key to all these forbidden doors the and portals. Forbidden port door. <laughs> <laughs> you need like a sound effect, like <laughs> creaking door opening. <laughs> <laughs> the forbidden villain. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, very interesting FB. there. Yeah. I know a lot of AEW fans are heartbroken. They wanted to see Marty uh, Dude, join his friends. I thought it was a done deal when that like merch came out that like. Was AEW merch for him on, uh, and it got leaked on uh, pro wrestling too. So I was like, oh, he's definitely going. And then yeah. plus, like the the few mentions of him on being the elite as well. Um, there's a lot of signs of Marty going to AEW. But hey, if this deal works out where he can wrestle in RH and AEW and NWA, here's here's the anything. thing. Yeah, this man about to win Finesse of the Year. I think didn't they say he's he yeah. has to work like 40 dates a year and he's got a bigger money yeah, contract. He, he's getting WWE main roster money to work 40 something Ring of Honor dates. And he's on the booking team. God. And he, <laughs> and he can still work NWA. At, at, I think New Japan also. That's crazy. So. Uh, last news item Kushida and Alex Shelley reunited their time splitters Hell yeah. tag team from New Japan. Uh, 
taking on uh, James Drake and Zach Gibson, the Grizzle Young Veterans. I think that's part of the Dusty Roads. Uh, yeah, that'll be their match this coming up Wednesday. That's going to do it for the news. Yeah, so Josh, take us home with the recommended match of the week. Hit the music! <laughs> we don't have any music. God. We need music. Um, so my recommended match of the week, I'm going to keep it on uh, theme here. This one comes from uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling Presents CMLL Fantastica Mania 2016 Tag 6. If you're looking for the date, we're looking at January 24th, 2016. And the match I'm recommending is a match for the CMLL World Lightweight title as Dragon Lee defends the title against Kamatachi. This was the first ever matchup between these two in Japan on Japanese soil. And I think it's very appropriate given the fact that we're about to see uh, a huge highlighted match between Ryu Lee and Hiromu Takahashi. <laughs> and um, this was really the match that kind of made both of these guys. Well, obviously they were bringing Hiromu back, but like, uh, spoiler, Kamatachi wins the title. Uh, Dave Melter gave this four and a half uh, at the time when he rated it. Cage match users have it rated at 8.79. I saw this match live when it happened, and I was blown away. Uh, one of the many fantastic matches between these two guys, and one of the last like big CMLL matches between them. Um, so if you haven't seen it, go out of your way. Check out Kamatachi versus uh, Dragon Lee from C uh, Fantastic Mania 2016. Nice. Well, that's going to wrap things up for this week. Next week, we'll be back with more coverage of Fantastic Mania and all the latest news in the world of New Japan Pro Wrestling. If you enjoyed today's show, please consider making a do donation. Visit socialsuplex.com slash donate. Click on that donate button under the Keeping It Strong Style logo, or you can donate to all your other favorite shows right here on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Make sure you connect with us on social media. On Twitter, I'm at Jeremy L. Donovan. The show is at KI Strong Style. You can also follow us at Social Suplex. On Facebook, we are Facebook.com slash Social Suplex. You can also find us in the Wrestling Square Circle Facebook group, Facebook.com slash group slash Wrestling Square Circle. On Instagram, we're at Social Suplex. And you can email me, uh, Jeremy at Social Suplex.com. On Reddit, I am the Pro Black Guy, and Josh is keeping a strong style. Before we go to the final part, Jamie, do you have anything you want to plug? Uh, no, nah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just keep doing the social suplex. Uh, com. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kind of losing it. I'm, I'm still on uh, Japan time. <laughs> well, we want to thank you for coming on the show and uh, just being the shining beacon of light that you always are. <laughs> Adding your insights and, uh, you know, your travel experiences. It's been awesome. Yeah, thanks yeah, for man. inviting me on. Yeah, man. We'll definitely have you back on in the future, man. Yeah, sure. So make sure you guys check out all the other shows on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. On Sundays, we have Foundation Radio, hosted by Rich Latta and James Boyd. On uh, Wednesdays, we have the Ricky and Clyde Wrestling Show from Scotland. Every other Wednesday, we have our podcast dedicated to independent wrestling. Grown men watch this shit, hosted by Jeremy Tate and Chris Bryan. On Fridays, we have Get in the Ring with Danny and Beast Mike. And on Saturdays, we have All Things Elite with Floyd Johnson Jr., Amy O., and Tiffany. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a rating, and review. We'll catch you next week on Keeping It Strong Style, the Ace of Podcasts. Ichiba. Thank you for listening to Keeping It Strong Style. We'll see you next time.